anything to do with real estate, investing, buying houses, maintaining our property, using the equity, how to retire. Well, those type of questions and more, credit score, the legalities of it, um, assignments, those types of things are going to be discussed today. So this is your opportunity to take advantage. If we can, let's retire on our houses. Let's make our houses make us money and let's do it right. So with saying that, you're going to make me rich. <laughs> 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 she's on her way she's almost there so uh first of all thank you uh she mentioned i'm kevin from smart money mortgages um we're a mortgage brokerage that specializes in real estate investments uh we help take first-time home buyers and turn them into multiple property owning real estate investors we did that because we realized that <clears throat> even some of our clients who have really good incomes it's still tough to build generational wealth on just your own salary, right? So for that reason, it's important to have your money working for you, right? So we found that real estate was the best way to do that, right? Particularly here in the GTA slash Golden Horseshoe area. And I'll go into why that is the market dynamics with the Golden Horseshoe, but I mean, real estate is gold. God is not building any new land, right? So the laws of supply and demand say that, look, um, if you have more immigration coming in year after year, um, there, there's not enough housing. So if you own as much as possible, your equity is going to increase. That's what you're going to be able to retire on. Um, as I said, we take first time home buyers, turn them into multiple property investors. And without knowing, I guess, um, where everybody is in terms of knowledge, and you might have some people who own a lot of real estate, some people who don't, I'll just start from the beginning then, right? So it all starts with credit, right? Um, the two things that make this engine run is credit and income, right? So um, I'm going to assume that everybody else here has good credit. Everybody here, I have to, but everybody has good credit because you're all bondable, right? You have to be for your, your industry. But even, even so, there are some people who have good credit, but because they don't understand how it works, they might make a critical error that could damage their credit. So just to avoid all that, we're going to go through how credit scores are tabulated and what lenders look for. So <clears throat> um, that's the general overview of all the topics we'll be covering today. So I think we all intuitively know that if we start missing payments, we're going to damage our credit, right? But um, what a lot of people don't know is that everything stays on your credit report for six years, and it's tracked by what's called the date of last activity. Usually on a credit report, you see DLA. That's what they track. After 72 months, it disappears, whether it's good or it's bad, right? <clears throat> the other thing that uh, impacts your credit, those first two are probably the biggest things, uh, the balance to limit ratio. So let's say that you have a $10,000 credit card, a $10,000 limit, and your balance is like $9,900, it's going to impact your credit severely. Right? You could drop your score by a good 90 points, 100 points, right? Uh, whereas if you have a $10,000 limit, and you're only carrying a balance of maybe $100, your score is going to be much higher. Now, that's actually the quickest way to bring somebody's credit score up. If they're, if they're carrying a high balance and we pay off that balance, within less than 30 days, their score will go up, right? <clears throat> the age of the trade line. So on your credit report, each item that reports, so whether it's a loan, it's a line of credit, um, those are all trade lines. So in the mortgage world, though, we only really look at loans, lines of credit, credit cards, right? The stuff you get from the banks, typically. We don't look at cell phones um, or some of the other things on there. I'll actually get into some credit reports. I'll show you what they look like. Um, there are two versions of an Equifax report. There's the consumer version that you'll see. It's more colorful. Uh, the layout's different. And then there's the lender version that we see. We're going to look at the lender version, and I'll explain some of the terms. <clears throat> So how many active accounts that you have? This doesn't so much impact the score as it does the lender's perception of you. So let's say that you have like 10 credit cards, right? Even though you might have good credit because they're zeroed out, the lender might look at it and say, well, yeah, he's got good credit now. He's not maxed out. But what if he were to run into trouble? He'd max up all these credit cards and not be able to afford it, right? So again, it doesn't impact the score so much, but the lender's perception uh, you don't want to have too many active trade lines. <clears throat> the size of the account. 
So to qualify for a mortgage, the general rule of thumb is you want to have at least two trade lines of at least $2,000 each reporting for at least two years, right? So a couple credit cards of $500 limits is not going to cut it, right? They want to see that you can carry major balances over a long period of time, right? So they want to see at least two years. The maximum they track is six. So if you have a few trade lines that are all six years old and you've been carrying them well, you have good credit. <clears throat> the number and frequency of inquiries. So an inquiry is each time somebody checks your credit, right? So I always tell my clients, do not fill out a credit application unless it's absolutely necessary because each time you do, it drops your score by about four or five points. So one is not a big deal, but I've seen credit reports and I'll show them to you in a minute where the client has gone all over town and you're seeing 10, 20 inquiries and it drops your score and each one stays on for three years, right? And a lender looking at it will say, well, this person's just a credit seeker. They're clearly in trouble. They're going all over town looking for, for credit. So you don't want to have too many inquiries on your credit report. Excuse me. Yep. Can you talk about hard hits versus soft hits? Sure. So a hard hit is exactly that. When somebody pulls your credit that you filled out a credit application, that's a hard hit. It shows on your report for three years. A soft inquiry is you already have an existing lender and maybe your credit card company wants to know if they want to increase your limit or not. They'll do a soft inquiry. It won't show to any other lender out there. Only you will see it when you pull your, your credit. Another soft hit is when you pull your own credit, right? It doesn't ding your score at all. So soft hits don't ding your score. Hard hits do. So uh, the question was, when cell phone companies check your credit, so you go into uh, TELUS and you fill out a, a credit application for a cell phone, that's going to be a hard hit. It's going to stay on your credit report for three years. It's going to drop the score by about four or five points. <clears throat> Length of employment and addresses. So again, this one doesn't affect the score, but it affects the lender's uh, perception of you. If you're always switching jobs and moving around every six months, you look like somebody who's unstable, right? So the chances of somebody giving you a million dollar mortgage if you're always switching jobs every six months, it's a little bit slim. Make sense? So just some tricks to boost your credit score. Um, one is to simply increase your balances. So every so often, if you've been maintaining your credit well, your credit card issuer will offer to raise your limit. Or if you have a line of credit, they'll offer to raise your limit. That's an overnight way to increase your score. Because again, the balance to limit ratio, right? If you had a, say a 5,000 balance on a 10,000 limit and they raise it to $20,000 limit, now it looks like you're only carrying 25%. You are only carrying 25%. So overnight, your score goes up, right? Um, the co-account holder trick. So a lot of lenders are ruling this out, but the way that it works essentially is, let's say that your spouse has a credit card, right? You can be added to that account. Now that's different from being a card holder because a card holder doesn't show up on the account and it wouldn't show on the bureau. But if you're actually added to the account itself, your name shows up on the account and the credit history now shows up on your credit report, right? So I'll speak for my on this one. When I was younger and I wanted to buy a house, but my credit was weak, uh, my mother at the time had a Leon's card. And at the time, the lender behind the Leon's card was HSBC. So I went to the Leon store and I filled out a credit application uh, along with my mother. She added me to her HSBC account. And overnight, the six-year history that she had showed up on my credit report and my score went up. Now, the reason why a lot of lenders have been phasing that out is because people were abusing it. They would advertise their credit cards on Kijiji and Craigslist. Here's a $1,500 credit card. Pay me three grand. You'll have credit. You know what I mean? Like, so it's abuse of the system. And so it's, it's getting harder and harder to find lenders who will allow that, right? But it's, it's an overnight way to boost your score. Pay down your balance before the reporting date. Then draw the same ones to pay. So it's just essentially revolving money. So let's assume then that you have two credit cards of $5,000 limits that are maxed out. You have a line of credit with a $10,000 limit owing five grand, right? So you owe $15,000 and you only have $5,000 to pay it. Each creditor reports to Equifax on a different day of the month. So they could report on the 5th, the 12th, the 20th. You got to call and check and see which date each creditor reports, right? So starting on the first of the month then, with your five grand, you'll pay off, let's say, the line of credit. Pay it off, 
It's a $10,000 limit. You're now owing zero, right? Moving on to the first credit card, <coughs> you have 10 grand in your line of credit. You use part of that to pay off the credit card, right? Say it reports on the 12, so that's paid off. You use the remaining 5,000 from your line of credit to pay off the second credit card. So that's zeroed out. Now, by the end of the month, it's gonna look like you paid off everything. You still owe 10 grand in your line of credit. But when I check your credit, it's gonna say everything's zeroed out. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, it's not fraud because this happens before you even fill out a mortgage application, right? It's only after you fill out the mortgage application and you're approved. If the lender says that you have to pay off your debts in order to close your house, and you do this, that, that would be fraud. You guys follow what I'm saying? <clears throat> so using low interest, like the mortgage, your mortgage is the lowest interest money you'll ever get, to pay off your high interest debt, right? So a lot of people, if they have equity in their homes, will use that to pay off their credit cards, right? You still owe the same amount of money, but the interest rate is much lower, and the payments are lower, you can pay it off faster, right? That's interest you pay it off faster. So just a few ways then to um, essentially boost your credit score. And, and manage your debt better. Make sense? So I'm gonna switch over to actual credit reports. I'm gonna show you two bad ones. I'm gonna go through why exactly they're bad, and then we'll get into two good credit reports. So I blacked out all the um, critical information. You're not gonna see the person's name. I'm sure they don't want their name shown on this credit report. Uh, as you can see here, the score, 516. So credit reports theoretically range from 300 to 900, right? I think the lowest I've seen is about 450. And for the first time ever, last week, I saw 900. Okay. Some of the reasons why, you're gonna see a lot of inquiries. Remember I said each inquiry drops your score by about four or five points, right? So this is an older credit review. I pulled it in 2016, right? So the inquiries start right there. And so she start, that's like 16 into 15. That's all too, that's a lot of inquiries, like it's just ridiculous. And then, below that, you'll see um, things like judgments. So she defaulted on a consumer proposal. Does everybody know what a consumer proposal is? Okay. So you have bankruptcies and you have consumer proposals, right? These are for people who can't afford to pay off their debts. Uh, they're, they're in a bad situation where, say, they owe $100,000. There's no way to pay it off, right? Most people in that situation should file for bankruptcy. But a lot of the, uh, the bankruptcy trustees, what they're doing is they're using the word bankruptcy, which is a red flag word, to scare people towards what's called a consumer proposal. The consumer proposal is essentially they, they make you pay a portion of the money that's owed. Say out of the 100000 you have to pay 50000 right? And they give you maybe four years to pay it. So you're making payments every month until this money's paid off, right? The thing with that is your credit is still damaged for three years after. It'll stay on your credit report for three years after that four year period, and you paid all that money. What this lady should have done is just file bankruptcy, and in nine months, it's discharged, and she'd owe nothing. You get, you get what I'm saying? So what she did, though, was she filed a consumer proposal, couldn't keep up with the payments, and now that's reported on her bureau, right? So it's worse than the bankruptcy. It's worse than even the consumer proposal. Um, you'll see some collection items there, a number of collection items. And you'll even see two judgments. So these are people, this is worse than collections. These are companies who took her to court and got a court judgment against her. Right? Uh, then you'll see her actual trade lines now. Um, so you'll see words like written off. I should use this pointer, right? <laughs> <laughs> you'll see words like written off, um, which means a bad debt. They couldn't uh, collect on it, so they sent it off to a third party. Collection agency. Again, so you'll see, yeah, assign to third party for collection. Uh, you'll see, so she's maxed out on a lot of her, uh, on a lot of her credit. So she's over the limit on this one. She had a twelve hundred dollar limit. Somehow she went two thousand six hundred and twelve. Right. So we'll get into what some of these terms are. You'll see terms like R five or O five, right? O five. R5. So R means revolving. That's typically credit cards or lines of credit. You can pay it down and then you can redraw on it again, right? R is revolving. I means installment. So an installment loan would be like a car loan. You pay it down every month until it reaches zero, right? O is open. So that's like a, a cell phone account. 
again, those ones don't count as real trade lines when you're getting a mortgage, right? So I1, R1, O1, that's good credit, you're good, right? R2, I2, O2, 30 days late, right? So once you get up to 04, 05, you're five and six months late, essentially, mm -hmm. right? And then R9 means collections, they've written it up. Mm -hmm. it. So you'll see some more of those. May I ask something? Yeah, sure. What was the issue with this person? <laughs> because she, it looks like she had a good job. It looks like, you know. She actually she actually makes over 100 grand. Right. Right. That's um, a good job. How did you know she had a good job? Because it said there she's a transit operator for the city of okay. something. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> we look for these things. Yeah, yeah. She, uh, she makes excellent money, but right. some of it, and, and I'm not a mental health expert, but I noticed certain things. She's not. Um, she does have some mental health issues, right? Oh. Um, but generally speaking, just really poor ma money management, right? Um, I was able to help this lady. We um, refinanced her home because she had some equity. And we managed to pay off all this stuff. And um, immediately get her a new start because it wasn't a bankruptcy or a consumer proposal. So once it was all paid off, she could, she could go out there and get a, um, a secured credit card, right? That's how... That's how people like this, once their debts are paid off, they can start rebuilding their credit, right? So you send $500 into Capital One, they send you out a $500 credit card, and hopefully, you know, repay it, your credit starts getting good again. They'll eventually send back your, your 500 bucks, you'll have a regular credit card, and you rebuild from there, right? That's the plan. So this is another individual who has a worse score, for, uh, 492. Um, I don't think she has quite as many inquiries, but what you're gonna see though is a lot of the lenders that she resorts to are what we call loan sharks in the industry, right? So City Financial, Prudent Financial, Easy Financial, Fairstone is the new name for City Financial. These are, they're loan sharkish in that their interest rates are crazy high and the collection items, collection actions that they take are very aggressive, right? Um, and it's typically only people who already have bad credit that are have to resort to these kinds of, of lenders, right? So, uh, yeah, you'll see Prudent Financial. Quite a, I don't know why she had so many Prudent loans, but um, again, that's an immediate red flag, right? And you'll see, like, she's that's her balance right there. That's her limit. So she's over the limit. That destroys her score. And she's... Pretty much maxed out there. Uh, if you scroll down some more, she's over the limit right there. So it's repeated behavior, right? This individual, you can see why she has a 492 score. So that's the end of her report. We'll get to some better ones. <clears throat> What's a good credit score? What's considered good? Anything above 700. So, um, Borderline scores are about 650 to 680-ish. Once you get over 700, you're good, right? It used to be, back in the day, you could buy a house with 5% down, best interest rate terms with 600, but no more. The, the standards are getting higher. You do need 680 at least now to really get the best terms. And even then, they're nitpicking, right? So uh, there are some lenders who want 720 and up. Uh, so this individual here, he has uh, 894. You're not gonna see a whole bunch of inquiries with this guy. You're not gonna see him maxing out his limit or anything like that. Um, so, where is inquiries? Are there any? Uh, yeah, these are his inquiries here, three of them. So not, not very many, and that's in a three year span, so one a year, right? Um, <clears throat> he's a retired individual, he actually didn't make a whole lot of money in terms of uh, annual salary, but just very good at uh, managing his funds. So you'll see right there, balance, zero, limit, 16K, right? Again, same thing. Balance, zero, limit, 10K, 21K limit, zero, zero, like, you know, he's perfect. Same thing, 15K limit, zero balance, all three. So, um, and again, none of the judgments or none of those uh, prudent financial loans. Uh, 
very good at managing his finances. Does he? Go ahead. Does he affect his credit that he has so many problems? So, again, that's the perception, right? Not so much the score. If somebody sees that you have a whole bunch of credit um, trade lines that are open, they'll wonder what happens if you um, start running them up. But if you notice, not all of his were, were open, right? Some of them are old and closed, right? Um, so like this one was closed in 2013. That's the date of that last activity we're talking about, okay. right? That it tracks you by. <clears throat> so this fellow has it 876, and you see some commonalities, right? He has one in three in three years. Um, this fellow didn't have a very high income either, but you'll see he's very good at managing his, his funds as well, right? Zero balance, 22,000 a minute. And his lenders, similarly, it's, you know, Scotia Bank, it's Royal Bank, those kinds, and they're all zeroed out, right? All zeroed out. So that's it for the credit reports. Anybody have any questions? Once again, you said perception versus... Credit score, right? So there are only so many things that the, uh, the algorithms in the, the computing software can do to determine exactly how credit worthy you are, right? You actually need a human to interpret some of this stuff. Um, I mentioned that this is the lender version that uh, like the bank see, mortgage broker see. When you pull your own credit, it looks different, right? So for instance, um, you'll see whether, oops, sorry, the fraud scan warning, you know, if uh, somebody tried to do something funny with their uh, SIN number, we'd see that. Uh, it gives us some of the explanations as to why they like this person's credit, right? So uh, it'll talk about, it'll break down the types of credit that he has, whether it's open, revolving, <coughs> installment, and it kind of gives you a breakdown. The, um, the consumer version is not that detailed. It's more colorful, it's more consumer friendly. You know what I mean? Um, the other thing I should say though too is, there are two credit reporting agencies in Canada. There's, there's TransUnion and there's Equifax, right? Equifax, for all intents and purposes, is the main one. That's the one that the mortgage lenders use primarily, right? The other one, TransUnion, it's not quite as reliable, and that's just because not as many lenders use it, not as many people use it. So what they do, though, to, kind, to try and catch up and get the people using it more is they offer it for free. So when you check your credit via Credit Karma, that's TransUnion. Some of the banks, if you download their app, will allow you to check your credit on there. That's TransUnion. So they're offering it for free so that more people will be updating. Because if you're not checking your credit, you're not updating it, right? And their information is outdated. So um, in the coming years, I suspect TransUnion is going to be catching up to Equifax in terms of reliability. But for now, Equifax is the gold standard. Did anybody else? Go ahead. I missed what you said about the first woman. You said she should have filed for bankruptcy. She, yeah, had she filed for bankruptcy, right? she would have had a nine month period where she would have had to make small payments, right, to the creditors based on how much money she has and how much she makes, right? But after nine months, it gets discharged. So she'd owe no money, right? She wouldn't have been in that situation where she has to pay, you know, maybe a grand a month for, for four years. And then a couple of years in after paying all that money, she can't afford it anymore. And then she gets this judgment against it. Do you know what I mean? Um, how do you recover from a bankruptcy then? That's the fear, the fear. So remembering that after nine months, you can actually go out and start getting secured credit cards and build your credit up. So the bankruptcy stays on for six years, but after nine months, you can start rebuilding. So that by the time the six years is up, you already have reestablished credit. You know what I mean? Um, the proposal takes longer, and it takes a lot more money to get out of. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So... Sorry, you could get that secured credit card after nine months? After nine months. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So right. Capital One offers them, Home Trust offers them, Refresh Financial, a few companies out there that offer That was kind of my, my question because if somebody's filed for bankruptcy and now they're applying for a credit card, mm -hmm. I would think that uh, more established companies will not want to provide credit because right. it would be these loan shark type cases. So it's, it's not that they're necessarily loan sharks, they are making you secure the credit card. So you literally have to send in the amount of money that they're going to send you back on a credit card. So the difference between that and like a prepaid card is that prepaid cards don't report to Equifax, right? Um, that's probably the main difference. 
Um, but even the banks offer secured credit cards. So Scotia Bank has a secured credit card. TD has it, right? Um, works the same way. You send in a thousand bucks, they give you back a thousand dollar credit card, and that's how people who either have no credit at all or are recovering from a bankruptcy would reestablish. Is a consumer proposal looked at differently by the lender in a bankruptcy if you didn't put the consumer proposal? That's another thing. So they're looked at the same. The trouble with the proposal is while you're in it, the lender won't look at you at all, right? The bankruptcy, there's just that nine month period where they won't look at you. Even though it's going to stay on for six years, they will look at you during that six years. Okay, so the question, sorry, was um, does the lender look at a proposal differently versus a bankruptcy, right? And yeah, the answer is the, uh, the bankruptcy, they'll look at you after the nine months, right? Whereas the proposal, they'll only look at you after the four years or however many years it took for you to pay that off. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. Once you're discharged from the proposal, whether it took you three years, four years, five years, it's looked at the same way as, as a bankruptcy. Yeah, sure. So the, the question was if you had two credit cards, five grand each, and uh, maybe one was max and the other one was empty and you kept juggling money back and forth, right? Would that boost your credit? It only boosts your credit temporarily, right? After that credit reporting agent, sorry, after that creditor has reported to Equifax, right? So even the trick I, taught, I told you about, it's a temporary thing for the mortgage broker to check your credit at the end of the month after you've zeroed out those accounts. Because the next month, right, those reporting agencies are going to report to Equifax again, and it's going to show the reality, which is that you're maxed out. You get what I'm saying? It's just, it's only going to last for a certain period of time because each creditor reports every 30 days. And I know I might be confusing with that. Anybody need more clarity? Like, meaning you still have a balance, right? You still have a balance. And the next time they report, it's going to show, right? So it's just a matter of getting a snapshot because that's all it is. This is just a snapshot of your credit on the right date to make it look a certain way. Do you get what I'm saying? It's not actually a way to um, improve your credit over time. It's just a way to boost it temporarily. Boost it temporarily <clears throat> for the purpose of like buying a home. Yeah. So yeah. You just want to look good for that snapshot. You know what I mean? It's like posing for a picture. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about the housing market, right? This is um, a topic that's near and dear to my heart because just a bit of background. Before I got my mortgage license, I was a real estate investor, right? And um, you know, people started seeing after a while that I was doing pretty well, so they come to me for advice. You know, they want to buy a house, but they have bad credit, they want to buy a house, but they don't have provable income. So I was able to find solutions for some of these people. Um, even some people who had a house, but they're in danger of losing it, power of sale, right? I assembled a, a team, right? So people with the lenders, uh, my real estate lawyer, so on and so forth, a team that would help these folks out. And one of my friends, my father's friend actually, who's a real estate agent, said to me, Kevin, why don't you get your mortgage license so you can get a commission on these deals you're doing anyway? And that made sense. So did the mortgage course, um, became a mortgage agent years ago, and then broker course, and last year I opened a broker. So um, the housing market, though, is what we, we focus on because, again, we like to focus on real estate investors, taking a first-time home buyer and turning him into somebody who owns three, four, five, six multiple properties, right? Because that's the way you're going to generate generational wealth. <clears throat> so these are the statistics from 1973 to 2018, the housing market in the GTA. So back in 1973, you could have bought a house for 40,000 bucks. <laughs> Good old days, right? Um, so we're going to focus on this column and that column. We're not going to focus on sales. Just average sale price, right? Yeah, I'm gonna say that again. Forty thousand bucks for a house, and that that was the average. So there were some houses you could buy for twenty thousand, eighteen thousand, right? Um, and gradually over time, of course, uh, you get up to about eight hundred grand, right? So we did the math, and that's an increase of about seven percent per year appreciation, right? And this is the way it looks on a graph. So, and this is the interesting part. Some of uh, some of the people here might remember 
the housing collapse oops, of 1989 into the early 90s, right? Um, but if we look at it, so this was the $40,000 a year, and it gradually increased, and then there was a rapid increase, right? And then a sustained crash. This is the only sustained crash that we've seen in 45 years. Um, if you look at here, this was 2008, 2009, the global financial crisis, right? Sparked by the, the US housing market bubble burst. We were barely affected. Um, two reasons. Toronto's housing market is super strong. Right, for a number of dynamics I'll get into. And also because Canada's mortgage rules are so tight, what you saw in the States would never happen. There's a lot of predatory lending going on in the States. There's no regulation. It was a wild west, so it was bound to happen. But um, our, our mortgage rules are so tight and our market is so strong, that's essentially the extent of that crash on us. Now, what it doesn't show there and what we'll get into is certain segments were affected more than others, as they always are. So during that time, the condo market was hit pretty hard. And unfortunately for me, I had two condos at the time and it was it was an ugly situation. But houses, like detached single houses at the time, were fine. And then after that crash, well, it wasn't a crash, but it was kind of leveled off. There was a rapid increase. You guys remember a few years ago, house prices were literally going up 33 and 34% per year, right? And of course, everybody was, not everybody, but certain people were saying, it's unaffordable. <laughs> People can't afford to buy houses. The government has to do something. And so they brought in a number of mortgage rules to restrict, um, I guess, the ability for people to qualify for mortgages, right? In order to bring down the prices of houses, right? Now, that's not a natural market dynamic. That's an artificial measure to try and bring the, the prices down. Um, it doesn't actually address supply and demand, right? But for the foreign investment. So a lot of what happened from 08 to 2016, 17 is that the global investor market looked at Toronto and realized Toronto is hella cheap compared because it's a world class city, right? So you compare it to Tokyo, London, New York, Toronto is very, very cheap. And so people in Dubai or Hong Kong said, this is where I want to put my money because they knew this was going to happen. You know what I mean? It was underpriced. So yeah, there was a lot of foreign investors looking at Toronto, particularly the downtown condo market, because it's something you can just buy, lock up, and leave. You know what I mean? Um, so for them, they, they looked at it as a great investment. If not for some of the rules that you like the stress test and so on, the housing market would have continued to climb, and eventually Toronto would look like New York, right, where ninety percent of the people rent because they can't afford to buy, right. And the people who did buy for pennies years ago are now billionaires, right? That's essentially how Toronto would eventually look. So we'll look at some of the factors affecting property appreciation. So number one is area. They always talk about location, location, location. So I've literally seen a rundown shack in Toronto selling for $1.5 million and a mansion out in Air or Woodstock selling for half that much, right? It's all about location. Downtown Toronto is the most expensive place outside of Vancouver in the country, right? Um, and as you go farther out from downtown, it gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So ever since the stress test, people were worried about, okay, how do I qualify? And we just say drive till you qualify, right? So into the 905s or the 519s if you have to, drive till you qualify, right? <clears throat> the age of the property. So this is why I really like pre-construction properties. New properties appreciate much faster, right? Um, housing type. So if you're familiar with uh, condo townhouses, those, as they get older, hardly appreciate at all. Some of them depreciate, right? It, it all comes down to desirability. Everybody wants to live in a single detached home, but then you have to counterbalance the desirability versus the affordability, right? Nobody can afford a detached home in the downtown core of Toronto. So... There's um, the desirability of a detached home, but then there's also the location, right? You might not be able to afford it downtown, but in Brampton, Mississauga, it's more affordable, right? And then obviously condition. You got a house that's in good condition, right? So here's a map of the Golden Horseshoe. And I don't know if you guys can see like these little 
green areas. Can you guys see that? Okay. okay. So that's called the green belt. And the government traditionally has never allowed development in those green areas, right? Um, so you're basically, developers are only allowed to build in this thin sliver of land going around Lake Ontario. And because there's less and less land to build on, the prices have to go up, right? It's the laws of supply and demand. <clears throat> Outside of this green belt, out here, prices are soft. There's no demand, right? In here, you're going to see a lot of the skyrocketing prices because we're running out of land. So this is a snapshot of uh, the housing market 2018. Remember, we saw that dip, right? Um, sorry, this is 2018 to 2019. So we're actually back up. Prices have come back up in 2019. Although the year's not done yet, we've seen a recovery, right? So it's not huge, but it's 3.2%. So from that high of early 2017 to the low of 2018, there's a drop of 4.5% on average, right? The single detached houses, the ones that are the most expensive and least affordable, fell the most. Those fell by about 14%. The condo market that got hammered in 2008, 2009, kept going up. It never, never got hit, right? Uh, but it all averaged out to a 4.5% drop. And so far, we're looking at a 3.2% increase over last year, right? So it's starting to come back up again. So this is the data that I look at when I'm trying to maximize my ROI, return on investment, right? So I identify areas where I can beat that 7% average. Right? So right now, as I said, condo apartments, because they're affordable, are what most people gravitate towards. So if you look at Gila region, right, high-rise condos went up 12.5%, right? Uh, Mississauga, almost 13%. Um, if you look at a single detached in, where is that? That's Georgetown, 9.5%. So I try, and, I try and analyze this to see where I can beat that 7% average. Make sense? And this is a chart of the overall GTA market since 2005, so like the last 15 years. And you'll see that peak in uh, 2017, it drop off into 2018, and it's back up again. Now, that's the general market. So that, that includes houses, townhouses, high-rise condos, all property types. But if we isolate just for condos, high-rise condos, you'll see that there's no drop, right? Because when houses got too expensive, and literally a detached home in Toronto was, well, it is now 1.227 million, but at the height, it was 1.561 million, right? So they couldn't afford that. They gravitate towards houses that they can afford, and that's condos, right? You can afford a five or 600,000 on a condo. And so that's where you see most of the money going. So, as I said, we, we take first time home buyers, turn them into multiple property owning investors, right? So, if you figure that a first time home buyer can buy a starter home in Brampton for 500 grand, right? So, that's going to be either a new um, freehold townhouse, sorry, a new condo townhouse or an older freehold. Does everybody know the difference between freehold versus condo? Okay. Um, freehold is more desirable, right? Condo, not so much because over the years, the condo fees increase, and if the condo fees get too large, then buyers are not attracted to it, right? Um, so the down payment on the $500,000 be $25,000. The mortgage owing will be four seventy-five dollars plus the CMHC fee. So are you familiar with CMHC and what that is, why you have to pay for it? Okay, that's the mortgage insurance. Any, anybody putting down less than 20% has to pay for mortgage insurance. After five years, that house, based on the 7% appreciation, will be worth $701,275, right? At that time, because you're paying down the mortgage as well, you'll owe $418,500. Right? So there's a difference there of almost three hundred dollars over the five years. Can you put down less than 20% on a property? I'm sorry, the person has this. So, the question is, can you put down less than 20% on an investment property outside of your principal residence? So the rules are no. 
there are ways to circumvent that. Um, so for instance, if you buy an owner-occupied property right now at 5% down, and let's say a year from now, your job relocates you to Niagara Falls or something, right? You can buy another property there for 5% down, right? Nobody, like, the rules are the rules, but they can't tell you you can't move. You know what I mean? Um, so yes, you can buy that second property with 5% down, so you now have two properties that are considered high ratio. It's just that you'd have to use two different insurers. So there are three mortgage insurance companies in Canada. There's CMHC, which is the main one, because that's the government. Then there's Genworth, and there's Canada Guarantee, right? So if you bought your first owner-occupied property with CMHC, <coughs> and then you then have to move, you buy either with Genworth or Canada Guarantee. Make sense? <coughs> Otherwise, you have to put 20% yeah, yeah. The general rule is you got to put down 20% to buy your second property. Anything other than your residence is 20%. Because once you move, you don't have to sell. You could rent that first property out, right? So, so at the end of the five years, then, what we'll do to extract that equity so we can use this capital, we will refinance the home at 80% loan to value, LTV loan to value. So that's the value of the amount of the loan versus the value of the house. So if you have a million dollar house, you owe $500,000 on a mortgage, that's 50% loan to value, right? So we take out some of that money, we can go to 80% of that 701, which is 561, 20, right? Minus what we owe. Now, what we owed was 418.5, but you're gonna have some legal fees to refinance and so on, right? Um, so you can actually extract $141,000. Right? And you can use that as your capital on your future investment property. So then the next question is now that we have this 141000 what do we do with it? We know we want to invest, but where do we invest and how? Right? What we're looking to do is get maximum ROI, return on investment. So I'm a big proponent of leveraging. This is how all the world's richest people, multimillionaires and billionaires, make their money. It's called OPM. Right, other people's money. They leverage. Um, the old saying, it takes money to make money. Well, if you only have a certain amount of money to work with, you can only make a certain amount of money. But if you have access to unlimited amount of funds to invest, then you can now earn unlimited amounts of money. So you leverage, right? So we'll, we'll get into how to, to leverage. But first off, let's say that you have $500,000, right, to invest in real estate. So you go out and you buy a house for 500 grand, right? and it appreciates at 7%, right, the historic average, that means on your $500,000 investment, you've now made a return of 35,000 on your 500K, 7%, right? But what if you were to leverage? So this time, same $500,000 house, but you get a mortgage on it of 400 grand. So that means your investment is only $100,000 this time, right? That's your capital, 100 grand. But the house still appreciated at 35,000, right? So now your ROI is 35%. Make sense? Your ROI, your return on investment has gone from seven to 35, just by leveraging. You still have the 500 grand, sorry, you have 400 left out of the 500. So, logically, you buy four more houses, right? So where you previously made five, sorry, thirty-five thousand dollars off of your five hundred grand, you're now going to make one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars each year off of your five hundred grand. It's the power of OPM, other people's money. Five mortgages. Yes, five mortgages, yeah. So and that's not an issue. Like I have plenty of look. I have clients of mine who buy a house every year, right? There are some lenders out there who limit your portfolio. They'll say once you get to four or five, you're cut off. But there are lenders out there who go to ten. Right? And then once you've maxed out uh, the amount that lenders will allow you to leverage, you can move on to commercial properties. There are different things, but you know, I always suggest max out your commercial sorry, max out your residential portfolio and then go into commercial, right? So you can only refinance mortgages No, you can refinance at any point. Sorry, what was the question? Okay, so the question was can you refinance before your mortgage is up for renewal? So the answer is Yes, you can refinance before your mortgage is up for renewal. You'll have to pay a penalty, though, 
So it's wisest usually to wait until your mortgage, mortgage term expires. Most terms are five years, so most people will wait until the five years is up and refinance. Um, but no, I mean, if you have a variable rate mortgage where you're just paying three months interest to break it, and you have an investment opportunity that makes sense, break the mortgage, pay the interest, and invest. Sorry, I think I had a question back. Yeah. Um, you're giving up your 500,000 to, to say four, Come up with that money, would you recommend or not recommend using equity in your own personal investments? Yeah. Uh, the question was um, to get the $500,000 to invest in those five properties, would I recommend using the equity in your existing home? Um, and the answer is yes, because otherwise uh, your house is not really an asset. So I don't know who's familiar with uh, Robert Kiyosaki, the real estate guru. Um, so traditional accounting says that uh, anything that's worth value a house, a car, a watch, that's all an asset, right, if it has value. Robert Kiyosaki says, no, um, if it's not earning you money, it's not an asset, right? So he says your house is not an asset. But if you're using the equity in your home as capital to go out and invest and make more money, it becomes an asset. And very rarely do people have half a million dollars sitting in their bank account. So typically, yeah, you do have to tap into the equity in your home, right? Um, what do you do with these other homes? I don't know anything about this. So if I buy five homes, I live in one. What do I do with the rest? Do you rent them out? Or yeah, you, rent them out. We get in, yeah, oh, okay. we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have uh, houses sitting empty. The whole idea is that yeah, you, you well, rent them clearly, out. Clearly, right? But I just thought, I, then you have to become a landlord. You do have to become a landlord, oh, okay. and we'll even get into the Landlord Tenant Act, oh, okay, right? Good. Because um, that's where a lot of first-time investors get tricked up because there are some very savvy tenants out there who take advantage of the new investors. Um, so question at the back of the room. Okay, so where would I find those graphs and charts? Um, TREB, Toronto Real Estate Board. That's, um, and then the last two charts were from CREA, Canadian Real Estate Association. Just go on the website. Um, when you eventually start talking about the landlord tenant, um, is there, will you touch on property management companies at all that can compare the two? Hiring a property management company versus being I, a landlord for your own property. Right. So I won't get into recommending any particular uh, companies, mm -hmm. but um, what I will say is once you get to four or five properties, depending on what your tolerance is, you might want to switch over to a property management company, depending on how, and it's a personal preference thing. Like I'm very hands on, so I like to do my own thing, but you have some people who like a more passive type of investment, so they'll just outsource to a property management company. So, the question is how else can we increase ROI, right? We talked about leveraging. Um, so there are three ways that a rental property generates profit, right? So the first one we, we spoke about, capital appreciation. You invest 100 grand in a property, as the value goes up, so does your, uh, your equity, right? Cash flow is what we're going to talk about next. So cash flow is the rental income you're receiving each month minus your expenses. So like your mortgage, your property tax, so on. Right? That would give you your cash flow. And then the third is the paying down of the mortgage. As your tenants are in there every month, they'll pay it down until your mortgage is eventually zero. So rental properties. Um, first scenario, you purchase a $300,000 house in the Niagara region. Um, Niagara region is a, is a very good area to invest in simply because the purchase prices are still fairly low, but the rents are high. So... Where in Toronto, even if you put down 20%, you probably still won't cash flow. But in Niagara, I actually have a client who put down 5% in cash flow. You know what I mean? Because the rents are high compared to the purchase price. So let's say you put down a 20% down payment. Uh, so your, your total investment would be the 60K down payment plus your $4,500 closing costs, right? So your land transfer tax and your lawyer fees. So... Your mortgage payment, property tax, home insurance, fourteen hundred a month. House rent for seventeen hundred per month. I'm being conservative here. Uh, it gives you your cash flow of three hundred a month, right? Thirty six hundred dollars annually. It's five point four percent on your initial investment. Appreciation up by seven percent each year, or twenty one thousand on your initial investment. So that's thirty two point five percent annually. Everybody follow so far? 
Okay, last one, mortgage paid down. So you're paying down principal each month by 400 bucks, $4,800 a year. So that's 7.4% on your initial investment. Grand total, 45.3% return on investment annually. So in terms of ROI, it's hard to get that kind of return anywhere. So a GIC might be 3% a year. A good mutual fund might be 8 or 9%. 10% a year, right? So here it is, you're making 45.3% ROI. We're always looking to maximize that. There are some ways to get it higher. Multi-unit rental is one. Same property, same down payment, same closing costs, right? But this time you build a basement apartment in there, a two-bedroom basement apartment. You spend about $30,000 for that. You uh, spend another 10 grand renovating the upstairs. So this could be the kitchen, Typically, you get the best bang for your renovation buck with kitchen and bathrooms, right, in that room. Um, if the kitchen's already done, you might want to lay down some hardwood, rip up the carpet, lay down hardwood, do landscaping, whatever. Just make the, make the property more desirable, right? <clears throat> so your total investment now is, oops, yeah. So your 64.5 plus the 40, your total investment is 104,500. Let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow. Uh, so your mortgage payments now are 1,560 bucks, right? The house now rents for 2,900 because it's not just one unit anymore, right? You're renting upstairs, you're renting downstairs separately. So $2,900 per month. Cash flow is obviously jumped to now $1,250 per month, right? 15 grand annually. Yeah. I'm just asking the rents of the rental units. Is that that they are legal rental units? Okay, so there's a distinction. Um, let's take Brampton for instance, right? Brampton is the land of the basement apartment. Probably about 95% of them are not legal, right? Um, so it's it's better, that's pers personal preference. Most people don't legalize it, but you can actually get more money for a legal apartment. And what you can do as well with the legal apartment is you can separately meter for hydro, right? Which is huge because, you know, you have two fridges and two stoves and whatever. So you can separately meter for hydro and in some cases water as well uh, if they're legal, right? If not, um, you save on the rental costs, obviously. It's cheaper to just go not legal um, and still make the money. Yeah, so, but one year after the rentals, and this is why flipping is so popular, right? You put 40K in and all of a sudden the house will go up by 100 grand, right? So... You've increased the utility. You've put in a basement apartment that's generating income. You've uh, beautified the residence, right? You've renovated the kitchen or you've done landscaping, laid down hardwood, whatever it is. So the house is more desirable. So rather than 300000 it's now worth four hundred k. So now your appreciation will be on that four hundred k, right? So 7% of the $400,000, $28,000 now, right? Your mortgage is being paid down. 459 per month or 5502 per year. All right, so between the appreciation, cash flow, the mortgage being paid down, right? The ROI is now 46.5% for an annual uh, income of $48,502, right? Now, the next stage is just magic, right? We're gonna talk about how to uh, really ramp up the ROI. I call it renovate, refi, repeat, right? So you've already renovated it. It's worth 400K, right? Now we're gonna refinance the house at 80% of the 400K, right? Which is 320. So your original mortgage was 240, right? We're gonna pay off that original mortgage, right? Um, you're gonna owe 236 after the first year, including your break penalty. Remember we talked about the break penalty? So you're now able to take out $84,000 from that refinance, right? So to repeat, house is worth $400,000. You uh, refinance at 80%, which is three twenty. dollars You minus out what's owing. You're left with $84,000. So really, sorry, one second. So really, your investment now is only $20,000. $20,500. Go ahead. So you're saying you use the HELOC to pay down the mortgage? Not a HELOC. A HELOC is a home equity line of credit. Oh, it could be that. This is... This is, yeah, this is a whole new mortgage. 
You get a new mortgage to pay off the old mortgage. It's a refinance. Renovate, refire, repeat, continue. So we have this 84K, right? Plus we still have 36,520 from the first house, your very first house, right? So you have a total of 120 grand to invest. Your total investment was 104, but after you took it out, like I said, it's only 20K now, right? So on your $20,000 investment, and your property is still making 48.5, your ROI is Bob's your uncle. You know what I mean? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay. I want to hear it, but I didn't get it. Okay. So we bought the house for three hundred thousand. Yes. We renovated it. We put a basement part in it. We did all this stuff. Now it's worth four hundred thousand a year later, right? We refinanced it because the new lender will go in and give you eighty percent of the new value of four hundred thousand. So that's three hundred twenty thousand dollars, right? You owed two thirty six. Right? So we paid off that 236 and you're left with $84,000. Right? Remember, this is your second property now. You already had one. And you didn't use all of the money from your first property. Right? You still had um, 36000 left over from the first property. You never even touched. Right? So you add that 36000 to the 84000 you just got by uh, renovate, refi, repeat, leaves you with 120. Right? So that's what you have for your next investment property. What's the timeline of this? One year. One so year one year for the second property, five years for the first. Five years. Yeah, five years for the first. It takes a while to get that. Because you only put in 5% on that first property, right? So um, it takes a while for your equity to increase as the property goes up in value. All the while, you got to make sure that when you take out the equity in your home, you can now still sustain the new mortgage. Yeah, yeah. Because the new mortgage will reflect the money that you're pulling out. Correct. So, a couple things, right? Um, the rental income that you're getting can offset if you increase the mortgage on your principal residence. You know what I mean? Um, and definitely, once you're acquiring properties and you're able to refinance, take out, it offsets a lot of things when you add up your, uh, your, your equity. You're now sitting on maybe a million, two million dollars worth of real estate. You get what I mean? So it's a it's a question of um, using your cash flow, banking it wisely, um, investing it wisely. Right? So no matter what you do with the money, but this is just a question of how do we increase the return on your investment? Make sense? Um, okay. So where were we? Don't worry, we have the accountant in the house. He's going to talk oh all about God. the tax. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just talking about how to make the money. Right? I'm not going to get into uh, what to do with the uh, CRA. <clears throat> okay, so, but to your question about the 20K. So, your initial investment was 104500 right? Between the down payment, the closing costs, and the renovation costs, 104500 once you took out the 84,000, now your investment is only 20,500, right? That's all you have invested in this house. You now have all your money back, most of the money back. So the house is still generating 48,500 each year on your $20,000 investment. So your return on that $20,000 investment is 236%. Make sense? Yeah, I'm a numbers guy. I'm not going to get into the renovations. I don't do the actual physical labor of flipping the houses and stuff. That's not me. But I just, you know, if the profit is there and the numbers make sense, let's do it. Now, let's bring this together. I want to buy houses all day long, but I only have one income. And equity is whatever the equity is in the home. Obviously, that's why I would come to you and you would tell me how to look at my credit score, look at my income, and how to pick up a second property. And I mean, look, all you really need to do with your income is carry your own house because I'm using rental income to qualify you for the rental properties. So whether it's one rent rental property or 10 rental properties, your income doesn't have to change. I'm using rental income to qualify for the rental properties. Make sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the question was, if you have a house and you've owned it for five years and it's gone up in value and you have some equity, can you do this? Yes, absolutely. And, and, and you should. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, 
Okay, so does everybody get the renovate, refi, repeat? And the reason why this is important is, as I was saying earlier, for the new investor, um, it can be a little bit of a minefield you have to navigate because there are a lot of laws and regulations in Ontario and most of them favor the tenant, right? And tenants know this. And they're always looking for opportunities to stick it to the landlord, right? It's just the honest truth. And to be honest, I fell prey to a lot of that stuff when I was first starting out. I had some bad tenants and I had to learn this stuff and I had to go to court and uh, go to war, essentially is what it is. So all residential tenancies in Ontario are for one year. After the first year, they automatically go month to month. So one of the things is you cannot force the tenant to sign a new lease after the first year, right? Um, all regulations under this law apply to all leases, residential leases in Ontario, whether it's written, whether you have a written lease or you don't have a written lease, all right? Last year, April 30th of 2018, um, the government changed the Residential Tenancy Act. They amended it, and now they have a standardized lease. You have to go onto the government website, download it. You have to use their lease. No longer can a landlord write up their own lease, right? Um, and you have to give the tenant a copy of the lease. And conveniently, it has all the rights and tells them how to screw you, right? Um, landlord can collect first and last months rent legally. You can't collect any more deposits. So no damage deposits, no security deposits, nothing like that. Landlord must provide a copy of the lease. And if they want rent receipts for the taxes, you have to provide those. And you can't charge for any of that. Um, so... As part of that amendment to the act last year, they expanded their rent control. So it used to be that um, rent control only applied to certain buildings, apartment buildings that were built during certain years. So the small scale landlord like myself, it didn't apply to, right? Now it applies to everybody in Ontario, right? <clears throat> so rent control meaning that the government tells you how much you can raise the rent each year. And usually it's a minuscule amount, like 1.8%, something like this, right? So it used to be that if rents went up in my area, I could say to my tenant, and all you got to do is give them 60 days notice, you know, rents going from 2000 to 2300 And they had a choice. They could pay it or leave, right? Now you can't do that anymore. The government tells you how much you can raise the rent. kind of sucks. But, um, one of the ways, probably the only way to get around this is to get the tenant out. If you can get the tenant out, you can reset the rent, the rent at whatever rate you want. The other one is if you buy a new property that has never been rented before, um, after November 30th of 2018, these rent controls don't apply, right? So it's only to pre-existing rental units. That was Doug Ford about. So um, purchasing a unit where there already has a yeah, yeah. And so the only way you'd be able to raise the rent above the um, above the guidelines is either apply to the landlord tenant board, which rarely works, or get the tenant out, and then the new tenant will be paying whatever you set the rent at. So if your lease is up, say, in, when I take possession, I have the option to not renew them. So if you're buying. So when it comes to buying a residential a, a rental property, I always recommend get vacant possession. Never inherit a tenant, right? Um, usually, if somebody has a good rental property, they're not looking to sell it. Um, the most common reason why people sell rental properties is a problem tenant, and so you never you don't know what you're getting into when you inherit a tenant. So have in your purchase and sale agreement a clause for vacant possession. So that way. The landlord, the existing landlord, will give their tenant 60 days notice that they're selling and they have to leave, right? Which they can only do after the first year lease is up. So once that original tenant's first year is up, the landlord can sell the property with vacant possession. You now buy it, you get your own tenant in at whatever price you deem fair. If utilities are included in the lease, the landlord must maintain those utilities even if the tenant's not paying their rent. It's one of those things that the government's just looking after the tenant, right? Um, so for that reason, I usually say, look, um, separately meter if you have a, a legal apartment, okay? Um, but it's, it's one of those things you have to look out for. And in all these things, you have to be mindful that yes, the government is looking out for the tenants, 
And so you have to really do your due diligence in terms of um, vetting potential tenants. The good thing is that right now it's a landlord's market. Like uh, last year I had a two bedroom apartment that came vacant. I put one ad in Kijiji, one ad in Craigslist, and in 24 hours I got over 100 replies, right? And so normally what I would do is, you know, you have a one o'clock appointment, a 1.30 showing, I couldn't do that. It was just an open house. And when people came and they saw three, four, five other families, now it became a bidding war, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was literally turning away good families. So it's not difficult right now to find good tenants at all. Um, it's much more difficult right now for the tenant to find a good place. Um, so the landlord can enter the property between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., whether the tenant is there or not, as long as we provide a 24 hours written notice. Uh, if it's an emergency, you don't have to give notice. If the tenant wishes to end their tenancy, they've got to give you 60 days written notice. They can only do that after the first year of the lease is up. Or unless you agree to it. Sorry, you said um, the one that the tenant not end within the first year. So you'd have to go to the landlord tenant board and uh, essentially you sue them, right? Because they're liable now. So you can report that to the credit bureau, you put that on your credit report once you have a judgment against them, right? And once you have a judgment, uh, if you take it from the landlord tenant board to small claims court, you can now start garnishing your wages, right? Okay. So the question is, what would have happened if? within the first year, the tenant just takes off, right? You have to go to the landlord tenant board, get a judgment there. You could then take that to small claims court to um, pursue further remedies. <clears throat> uh, so there are a number of reasons why a landlord can end a tenancy and evict a tenant, right? Obviously not paying their rent in full each month, uh, paying rent late, damage to the property. Illegal activity is probably the quickest one. You can get them out in 14 days. Um, affecting the safety of others. Those are typically the reasons why. Also for personal use, right? So uh, too many people in the rental unit. If the landlord wants the rental unit for their own use, this is one that changed last year as well. So prior to this, all you had to do was give the tenant 90 days before. You would say, okay, well I have family moving here, they need the place, you gotta leave, right? Now, the government has said, you have to give them one month's rent if you want them out. And you have to go to the landlord tenant board and prove that your reason is legit. You actually have family or it is some kind of hardship or whatever. And you still have to pay them, right? Uh, and it's a direct relation. Yeah. You've been so, through. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it has to be like, uh, you know, my mother, my father, my son, my daughter. It can't be my second grandfather's father. You moved, he, yeah. yeah. It has to be a direct relation. It's, it's an uphill battle to try and prove that. And then you still have to give them once rent. <laughs> um, yeah, so also if obviously you've sold the property and their first year lease is up and you've agreed to the seller to give them vacant possession, you can get the, the tenant out that way as well. If you have to do major repairs or renovations, you can get them out. Typically though, if they fight you on it, you're going to have to compensate them. You're going to have to give them money to stay somewhere. Oh, jeez. Question for that? Really More time. Going back to the family, like, you still have, so it's, you have to pay that one month rent, right? but you still have to give them the 90 days notice. Yeah, both. Yep. I believe if I'm right, it's 60 days, and then, then you have to give them one month's rent or time, which, which makes it 90 days. So if you don't give them cash. The, the 90 days without giving, giving them that one month's instead. Right, right. So, so the question was, uh, what happens if the tenant is late, but then they pay up? But it's repeated behavior, month after month. They're late, they pay up, right? It's a frustrating process. It does come down to timing though, right? So I think on the next slide I talk about if they're late on the first, so they don't have it on the first, you serve them on the second, right? With a 14 day notice, right? If they pay within that 14 days, nothing happens, they get to stay. If the 14 days elapses, then you take it to the landlord tenant board and you can get a bailiff to come out and evict them, right? So I don't know exactly how late they're paying, um, but if it is more than 14 days, then obviously they can, you can kick them out that way, right? Um, but yeah, if they're paying like on the third or the fifth, there's not much you can do, really. Like one oh, really? Oh, no. they, they should have been out. Yeah, I mean, look, um, 
the landlord tenant board is essentially you're going to have an adjudicator sitting there and the tenant will make their case you'll make your case and the adjudicator will make a decision right um in a case like that though where it's repeated behavior they should have the tenant out particularly if they're months behind there's no excuse for that they should be out right like in my cases yeah second day of the month i served in the notice 14 days later we're going to court and um, they're usually out within just over a month so i don't run into that problem but yeah the, the, the trick is to have documentation yeah. if it's repeated behavior on that third, on that second or third day, you serve them the notice. If it's if they do this month after month, and you serve them three notices and then they pay up, then you take that to the adjudicator. They'll they'll really they'll see that pattern and then you basically have the evidence. So the trick is to serve notice, take a picture of it, and then you provide that as part of your evidence when you uh, serve your application to the landlord tenant board to see how much you do. And this is just what we were just talking about. 14-day notice and so on. Um, I started doing rent-to-owns because of those issues that I was having with tenants, right? Um, rent-to-own was the perfect uh, investment vehicle because it starts with a residential lease, a regular lease, but the way it works is that <clears throat> you're going to have a predetermined term, either two to five years, for that tenant to, on top of their rent, they'll be paying maybe another four or five hundred dollars or so, um, that will accumulate over time to their down payment. So this is somebody who wants to buy a house, but they don't have the down payment. They probably need some time to work on the credit as well, right? Um, so at the end of the two to five year term, typically five years, if they don't have any down payment, it's going to take time to build that up. At the end of the five year term, you credit back that money as their down payment and they're able to close, right? But the reason why it's beautiful is because if at any time during that five years, they lapse on their rent, they forfeit Maybe it's ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars that they have built up in their their, uh, their rent credits, right? So they're on their their the best behavior. So for illustration purposes, we uh, target a, a house that's worth about three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Reason it has to be that cheap. Um, a few years ago, the government brought in a new rule. They're always tightening the mortgage rules. A new rule that says anything above five hundred thousand dollars, you can't buy with five percent down anymore. Right? Above five hundred, you have to add ten percent down. Right? Um, and so for a rent to own to really work, you have to keep it at 5%. So we buy at 350 so that when it appreciates year over year, you end up at 500 grand. Make sense? So with a 20% down payment, you know, your, oops, your down payment is 70K, 5,000 closing costs, your investment is $75,000, right? So your cash flow, you have mortgage payments, property taxes, home insurance of $1,600 a month, right? The house rents for $1,700 per month, but then they also pay another $500 a month towards their rent credits. And these are what add up to their down payment at the end, right? Yields a monthly cash flow of $600, $7,200 annually, 9.6% on your uh, initial investment, right? It appreciates 7%. On the three hundred fifty thousand dollars, right, twenty four five each year. That's thirty two point seven percent annual ROI on your seventy five thousand dollar investment. Everybody got that? The mortgage is being paid down by four eighty each month, five thousand seven hundred sixty dollars each year, seven point seven percent additional ROI. <laughs> At closing, we're going to refund that thirty thousand dollars. That's their rent credits they've accumulated, right? So that's a minus 40% total ROI, or minus eight each year. You get what I mean? So you have to pay that money back, or you have to credit it back. <laughs> so at the end, that's 42% ROI annually. And these are the added benefits that, that I spoke about, all right? They take much better care of your property because it's actually gonna be theirs, right? That's gonna be their house. Um, they're not gonna miss a rent payment because then they forfeit their, their rent credits. And you also, and this is huge, you have a guaranteed sale with a guaranteed price. You don't have to go out and pay 5% for a real estate agent. You don't have to bargain or negotiate a sale price. You already know what the sale price is going to be. It's pre-sale. Right? If you were to buy this rent-to-own property with only 5% down, leveraging even more, 
the ROI gets pretty crazy at that point. Um, same house, but with 5% down, your investment's only 22500 right? Now your mortgage payment's gonna be bigger, right? Because you're leveraging more, 2000 a month after property taxes and everything. Rents for 1700 per month, um, and rent credit same, 500 bucks. So your cash flow this time is only 200 a month, right? But it's actually 10%, sorry, 10.7% ROI because your investment is so much smaller, right? Your capital is, is smaller in this. Appreciation, same 7%, but much higher ROI because your investment is only 22 grand, right? <laughs> the mortgage is being paid down each month, um, 800 bucks. ROI, again, is much bigger because your investment was much smaller. At the end, you still credit the $30,000 back to the um, to the rent tenant buyer, right? Huge ROI, again, because you're leveraging more, right? And the same benefits. Guaranteed sale price at the end, no negotiating with, uh, with the buyer. Who takes care of the property while this is going on? So who's responsible for it? Is it the tenant or is it you as the owner? So it's the tenant for anything that's minor. Um, and because, again, because they see this as their house, right. they're not going to be calling you for the little silly nitpicking stuff that a usual tenant would, right? They'll just take care of it. Um, if it's something major, like the roof's got to be replaced and it might be seven grand or whatever, um, the owner has to take care of that, right? Um, and for that reason, you might want to buy something that's newer or get a proper home inspection done. Just make sure that your, your actual house that you're buying is sound so that you don't have those kind of issues. And then everything else is minor and the tenant will take care of it. Does this apply to condos as well or just houses? It applies to condos. The reason why most people don't use condos is because of the condo fee. It's a variable you can't control, right? right? So we know generally that condo fees go up every year because maintenance costs go up gradually. Mm -hmm. But um, every once in a while, if the management of that condo is very poor, you'll have what's called a special assessment put on, right? So years ago, I had a condo where it was twin buildings that had certain elements that they shared, like the pool and parking, and but different management. And oh. so one condo board was suing the other. That was my building. <laughs> <laughs> are you, are you, Do not ask. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's retarded. So, yes. <laughs> so the two buildings are suing each yeah. other, and the legal fees just balloon, mm -hmm. and they put on what's called a special assessment mm -hmm. on top of each unit owner. So we're... Your condo fee might have been 450 bucks each each month. It's now $900 and there's oh, nothing you can do about yeah. it. Nothing, but pay yeah. it. Because if you don't pay it, then they notify the lender, your mortgage lender, your mortgage lender pays it and then makes you pay it. And if you don't pay it, they power sale your house. So you really don't have any choice. And that's the reason why um, for this purpose, condos are not the best, right? Uh, because it's, it's a variable that you can't control, right? Uh, okay, so where are we? Beautiful building. Yeah, it, it happens. Oh. No, it, look, um, it's not like it only happened to one or two buildings. It happens. And to some of the most attractive buildings out there. It's a matter, it's not so much the building or what it looks like. It's the, the condo board. Because when the building is being built, sometimes some unscrupulous individuals will find their way onto that board, right? Mm -hmm. And so their only job there, in their mind, is to find ways to siphon cash into their pocket and their friends. Right. Anyway, so that's that sort of stuff can happen with condos. Yeah. And we're going to get into pre-construction and kind of touch on why some builders are better than others and why pre-construction is such a lucrative opportunity. Always or certain times? Pre-construction? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to say always. Um, or I can say always, but sometimes are more lucrative than others. You know what I mean? Um, so some of the advantages. Very rapid appreciation. I'll, I'll give you an example that a couple of you know of. Um, so... There was a property, it was a freehold townhouse that I bought a few years ago, a year before it was built, right? Um, corner unit, nice lot. I bought it at $460,000 from the builder, right? And a year later when it was built, a couple of my neighbors down were selling for six forty. dollars So in one year, it went up $180,000. My deposit, my investment, my capital was thirty five dollars So on thirty five dollars I made $180,000 in a year, right? And this is not... Like a rare thing. This is this is the reason why some people solely invest in pre-construction, right? Um, and then we'll get into assignment sales, 
which is kind of an offshoot of uh, pre-construction where, so it's not common in houses because you only have a year or so to work with. But in condos, high-rise condos, a lot of times they're selling units three or four years before it's built, right? And so there are buildings being built right now downtown Toronto that it's worth, a unit there might be worth 600 grand, but was initially bought for 300, three years ago, right? Um, and so what the initial buyer will do is, let's say, buy it at 300 grand with a deposit of maybe 60K, right? And maybe six months before it's built, they'll sell the right to buy that unit. It's called an assignment sale. Um, and they'll sell it for, instead of 300 grand profit, 250. So the end buyer will have saved 50K and the original buyer made off like a bandit. Everybody's happy. You get what I mean? That's an assignment sale. Um, my colleague who's a lawyer will be coming in to talk about some of the legalities of the, of the assignment sale. So very rapid appreciation. It appreciates with no expenses. So during the time that you're waiting for this house to be built, there's no mortgage, there's no property tax, there's no anything, right? It's just going up in value on its own. But there are, I've heard, and there's one around my area where people took a deposit and like, building has gone belly up. Yeah, that happens. Um, it and it's not that it's an expense. Some people are doing the putting money in deposits down, and then the builder goes belly up. So you're... So it's not that you lose your money. So let's say that you put a deposit down on a pre-construction condo building, right? And let's say that they project this building is going to be built in 2023. You put down $60,000. It's going to be a great opportunity. And then maybe six months or a year later, builder files for bankruptcy or they tell you the project's not going to be built. Whatever happens, it's not going to go forward, right? So typically there are... That's when you have to apply to the to the government. There, there are some remedies. You're going to sue that builder if they don't return your your deposit. They usually do return the deposit. The what trouble is, the so they they haven't necessarily filed for bankruptcy. Some do, right? But they usually do return the deposit. In the times that they do return the deposit, the only thing you've lost is opportunity, because if we're talking about appreciation being the reason why you bought that unit, and after three years, you're expecting to double your money or triple your money or whatever it is, and all they're doing is returning your deposit, and you could have parked that money somewhere else and made money on it. It's lost opportunity, right? Um, the builder, like I said, they usually do return it. In the cases where they don't return it, usually it ends up in like the Toronto Star. I've read about those situations where a number of the uh, potential buyers had to come together in class action lawsuit the, this builder, right? If they have filed for bankruptcy, it gets sticky because that means that they're basically saying we don't have all the money to return the deposits. That's what that means, right? So it's not a win in every case. So this is why we're actually going to talk about some of the builders that I prefer. You know what I mean? Um, it does come down to when you're making a decision, and this is on the next slide, um, where, like uh, location, 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 but also which builder you want to get into bed with. That's what you're doing, right? Like it's a major investment. Um, so yeah, you have to do your due diligence. So what were we saying? Um, yeah, so it appreciates during that time you don't have any mortgage claim or property tax or anything like that. Also, you get a new warranty. Uh, Terry on warranty, there's a seven year warranty on everything that's major, right? So the foundation, the structure, the major stuff, and a two year warranty on the minor stuff, little cracks and stuff like that throughout the house. Also, because there's a warranty, you don't have any major expenses, repairs, right? Some builders will, will uh, accept a 5% deposit, which is great because if all you're doing is essentially parking your money and appreciating it, you want to park as little as possible, right? Rather than 20%, if you can get away with a 5% deposit, great, because you're still going to make the same amount of appreciation. Um, some people will, some builders will allow the assignment sale, some won't, right? Some will say, Look, we're trying to sell units. If you're selling units at the same time as the conflict, you won't allow it. But most builders, particularly high-rise builders, they allow it because they know that it's, a, it's an investor's game, so they're trying to attract the investors. So the idea behind this, when you're buying pre-construction, you just leave this basic as possible. Because don't a lot of these builders say, oh, you can upgrade the floors, but it's going to cost you a couple of thousand. You can upgrade this, appliances. 
So do you pay those for those upgrades or do you leave it at the base? So a lot of that depends on what you plan on doing when it's built. So some people who are just selling the assignment will just do a basic. I prefer to close and then rent it out for another two to three years because the property does continue to appreciate rapidly for the first few years afterwards. And so I go for a good amount of upgrades, right, to make it attractive to the tenants. Um, certain upgrades I know that the builder is building in their profit margins, so certain things I know I can do aftermarket on my own. You know what I mean? Um, so it kind of <coughs> depends on which upgrades, but it also depends on what it is you're planning to do with this investment. <coughs> So what are the major factors to look for? High demand area. So if you're talking about condos, you're looking at downtown Toronto, possibly the square one area, right? Places where people are attracted to um, and high rises are in demand, right? Um, or you're looking for places where you're gonna build a new go train line or something like that, or some new attraction, maybe Google's gonna build a new headquarters, right? You're looking for something where that area is expected to, to bloom and blossom and you're gonna get a good return, right? <clears throat> you're going to want to compare price per square foot because they're going to be in any given area several builders offering their properties and you're going to want to compare which builders are offering the best price per square foot now this is a big one it's one we mentioned before um for high-rise condos i find the best builder is tridel i don't know if you heard of them but um, i say they're the best not because they don't have some of the defect they, they are pretty good in terms of the quality but even more so the fact that they do their own property management. So you know how condo fees tend to go up year over year? That's a function of how well or how poorly the building is managed. Tridel does their own. So what I've found is even in a 10 or 15 year old Tridel building, the fees, monthly fees hardly go up, right? Whereas in some of the more, I don't know, attractive buildings, but with lesser known builders, uh, the fees are skyrocketing like crazy. So a good example, uh, if you look at Mississauga Square One area, right? The absolute buildings, the Marilyn Monroe, really attractive, horrendous investment, right? Um, properties there, the values have actually gone down because the maintenance fees have gone up so much. Just poor management. So it's a very attractive looking building, very cutting edge and all that stuff. Um, but from an investment standpoint, it's poorly managed and so the values aren't going up. Walking distance from there is uh, Tridel's Ovation buildings. They're about 12 years old or so. Maintenance fees are half or less than half as much as at, uh, at uh, Maryland Monroe buildings, right? Now, the Tridel buildings, their units inside are very basic, right? Um, almost unattractively basic, right? Outside, is, it looks like a, like a huge hotel, waterfalls, whatever. It's, it's, it's beautiful. You go inside the unit, though, it's pretty basic, which is fine. Most people like to renovate to their own tastes. But uh, yeah, Tridel is a good example of, of a quality builder who stands behind the product. And I don't mean that to give you a Tridel commercial, but just to underscore the fact that you gotta kind of research the builders, um, particularly with condos. Single family houses, um, I personally prefer Madame. Reason being is they also have defects just like any other builder, but they're a lot more responsive. You call them, they're coming out to fix your house, right? Whereas most other builders are going to give you the runaround till infinity, right? Um, <clears throat> also, from an investor standpoint, the demand is just more for a, for a madam home. Like literally, when they announce an opening at one of their sales centers, people are lined up for days, for days, right? So that kind of demand, it's just, um, it's good for an investor. Right? You want to know that when you put your property on the market, there's going to be a lot of uh, demand for it. Right? Also, you want to look at what's included. Uh, appliances, upgrades, amenities. Some of the condos, the new high-rise condos, have bowling alleys, basketball courts, movie theaters, so on and so forth. Um, so if you're marketed to an area where there are a lot of young people, like 20s and 30s, they like the amenities. Right? Are you paying for them? So, of course, you are paying for them. But what I've noticed is that if you can find a building where a couple of buildings are sharing those amenities, the maintenance fees are lower, right? So a good example of that, um, you know City Place, downtown Toronto, right by uh, Skydome there? So I used to own there. There's four buildings that share the same amenities and they are world-class facilities, 
like 50 meter pool, bowling alley, whatever. They have everything. Um, yet the maintenance fees are low because instead of, let's say, 100 homeowners paying into the, the um, I guess, these amenities, you have 400. And so the cost is divided by that many people, right? So it just depends, right? <clears throat> um, allowances. So again, some builders will allow you to sell pre-construction on assignment. Some builders will not. So it's, it's something that, if that's part of your strategy, if you plan on not closing, because there are costs when it comes to closing, right? You have to pay development levies, you have to pay um, the lawyer, you have to pay land transfer tax, <coughs> HST. So if you don't plan on closing, um, selling on assignment is something you want to look for and make sure it's allowable by the uh, developer. Um, a lot of builders don't allow Airbnb, right? Um, and so for that reason, the buildings that do allow Airbnb are going to be a lot more attractive to the investor, right? Oh no, what did I do? Okay. <laughs> Stay there. Um, it means that you have to close. You don't necessarily have to live there, but you do have to complete the closing from the builder, and then you can sell it if you want or rent it out or whatever. So the question was, if they're not allowing assignments, do you have to live in the property? Um, the answer is no, you don't have to live there, but you do have to complete the closing, right? In some situations, you have to go on to the house to serve the community. That's more of a taxation question. Um, other, yeah, so another question I look for as an investor is are you able to lease during occupancy? So, this is more of a high rise condo thing. So, um, if you have bought on a lower floor um, in a high rise building, They'll have completed your unit while they're still working upstairs, right? And there'll be an occupancy period. So you can't go out and get a mortgage on this property yet, but they allow you to live there and pay an occupancy fee each month, right? In that time, if they allow it, you can rent that out to a tenant, right? Until the building is complete and you have to actually get a mortgage to buy it and finish the closing. And your tenant can stay or whatever the case is, but a lot of builders don't allow you to lease out the unit while it's in occupancy. You guys follow that? Yeah, townhouses are like that too. Townhouse condos. Townhouse condos, yeah. They, so, built. they still have an occupancy fee. They still have an occupancy fee. Yeah, because it's, it's a condo townhouse, right? Um, and then they have kind of this hybrid model, which is what they call a stacked townhouse. Mm -hmm. So it's like three levels, and it kind of it's a hybrid between a traditional townhouse and a high rise condo. It's stacked. And they're more common now because, again, we're running out of land, right? So most people, if they're older especially, don't want to live in a high-rise condo, but they'll more gravitate towards a stacked townhouse because it's more house-like. You know, they don't have the huge maintenance fees that come along with the swimming pool and the bowling alley. Um, it's a very small maintenance fee, usually about 100 bucks a month, 150 bucks a month, so it's manageable. Um, but it is technically a condo though. <clears throat> Okay, so the question was about um, builders putting a tenant in there and then they kind of, uh, they get the lease enforced and then you have the right to essentially own it and it's your tenant, but it's the builder who, ha who happened to get you tenant. Yeah, so the guarantee, so the guarantee is sort of maxed too, right? So if, if, they let, if they rent it out for 2100 and the agreement was for 300 then they'll supplement the equity dollars. So more and more builders are catering towards the investor, right? And um, a lot of these buildings are going up in places like like uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, around the university area, um, or like Kingston, again, or Niagara, around the university areas where they'll find you a tenant and they'll guarantee you a certain amount of rent. Even if, let's say, they have an issue and they can't find a tenant, they're still guaranteeing you your rent, right? Um, <clears throat> so I don't necessarily get into those kind of investments because I've seen the numbers on them and I think I can do better on my own without having... The, uh, the builder who wanted to find a tenant, but um, sorry, what was your, your actual question about it? Because there was, uh, we bought an investment condo and they, they, they gave us the lease back option, or mm -hmm. the other option was that they were going to give us back a certain amount of money, I can't remember what it was. Yeah. So we ended up taking the lease back option, but now I'm like thinking, was that the correct move? It's hard to say, I'd have to see all the numbers involved to see. Go ahead. I'm going to say for lease back, I have the same thing. I've yeah. lease back, but you have to do your work here. Sometimes 
stock options, they're, they're gearing, they're nicer building, they're gearing for a higher rent. Um, so if they can get it, Great. power to them, and they, gear, they guarantee it anywhere, as we saw in the German design. So it actually is like a little bit of a little wind up, because they have to give you that rent for the winter or two years or one year. And so I mean, I took advantage of it because I thought, I don't know how much I'm going to get that rent. But you know what they're doing? They they're marketing to a lot of overseas students, right? Yeah. So, I mean, if this is a student that's coming from a very rich family in Japan or Hong Kong or Dubai or wherever, yeah. um, their parents are loaded. They don't care, right? They'll yeah. pay that rent. And, and they're not familiar enough with the area to do the groundwork to go and find a cheaper apartment, nor do they care. So the university will reach out to those kind of people and get the rents that are otherwise you wouldn't be able to find in that area. You know what I mean? So we're going to talk a bit about investing in private mortgages. So this is more of a um, hands-off, passive investment vehicle, right? Um, essentially, you become the bank, right? Uh, so you're familiar with the typical homeowner who has a mortgage from the bank. They're paying their mortgage each month. If they happen to not pay their mortgage for a while, the bank can then take the house and sell it, right? As an investor, um, you can actually lend money to a homeowner have it registered against the title of that homeowner by a real estate lawyer and have that homeowner pay you each month um, and that is essentially a private mortgage. Now with private mortgages, the interest rate is much higher than what you'd find from a bank. A uh, good mortgage rate these days, a five-year fixed might be two and a half percent, right? Um, private first mortgage is around seven percent because it's an individual who's looking to make a return on their money, right? Um, typically, though, the investor is going to be want to be is going to want to invest in second mortgages rather than a first mortgage, because a second mortgage you can make twelve percent, twelve percent interest rather than than a seven, right? Um, so the way that works is, let's say that you have an eight hundred thousand dollar house, right, and the homeowner owes four hundred thousand dollars on the first mortgage, but he wants to renovate his house, build a basement apartment, so on and so forth. Um, he doesn't want to break his first mortgage and pay a huge penalty. So he's going to get a second mortgage for maybe $100,000, right? Um, he would approach a mortgage broker like myself. I would find the money from a private investor. We register the $100,000 against the house. He pays each month. It basically works out to be $1,000, right? Because he's paying at 12% a year, right? So you would receive direct deposit $1,000 each month. Now, me personally, what I like to do is prepay. So if you're loaning $100,000 and we know that it's 12% that you're getting on that return, we'll deduct the 12 grand up front. So the homeowner is really only getting $88,000, right? And at the end of the one year term, you get your whole $100,000 back. You've already gotten your return initially. You guys follow what I mean? We'll go through the slides, but that's, that's the gist of it. So the goal that you wanna do, you wanna secure your capital, Secure your return on your investment and secure your exit. Because if you're not exiting with your money, it's no good to just have it tied up here, right? Secure your capital. Your investment is secured against the real estate, right? Again, if the person doesn't make your payments, then you can take the person's house and sell it, right? It's underwritten by a mortgage broker and administered by a lawyer. We get a professional appraiser to go out and ascertain the actual market value of that home before we issue any money, any money on it. We ensure that the loan to value, so the amount of the loan versus the value of the home does not exceed 80%, right? We just don't want anybody's money at risk. <clears throat> Secure your return. The rate of return typically is uh, 12%. So again, if you're loaning $100,000, $1,000 per month. We often arrange for the entire term to be prepaid. Again, so uh, that way, there are no monthly payments for him to make. And if there are no monthly payments, he can't default. Right? And the other benefit is you know exactly how much money you're going to get. The rate of return doesn't fluctuate. So if you were to put your money into a mutual fund or the stocks, that stuff goes up and down all the time. You don't really know what your return is going to be. Right? Here it's already pre predetermined. Secure your exit. So each one of these private mortgages has a fixed term, usually it's one year. At the end of the term, uh, the mortgage has to be paid back. Typically, that homeowner is gonna refinance either his first mortgage and pay out the first and the second, or 
he'll just refinance the second with a new mortgage to pay you out, right? Or they could sell. But either way, after the first year, it's got to be repaid. Um, during that year, if the homeowner wants to sell, remember, this mortgage is tied to his property. So in order for him to sell, he's got to pay you back the money. Same with refinance. If they want to refinance their home, your money would have to be paid back. The, uh, the exit strategy, as a mortgage professional, I typically uh, discuss that with the borrower ahead of time so we know exactly what the exit strategy is going to be. Are they going to be selling? Are they going to be refinancing the first or the second? You know how your money is going to come back to you. Let's determine fairness. This is like the lowest ROI you're going to make when you look at investing in Some of the other, yeah, right? yeah. So, um, so you're basically, the money you're making is just the interest. So if it's 12% on your, so you spend $1,000 a month, essentially you're, you're making $12,000. So it's low, but you're still making money. So making, and it's it's totally, uh, unlike some of the other things we're having to deal with tenants and, and that sort of stuff, it's, it's totally passive um, income, right? There's no learning curve here where you have to potentially go to a landlord tenant board and you know, battle some uh, real tenant or anything like that. It's just basically you park your money like you would any other investment. And there are ways to make it um, RRSP eligible. Um, there are ways to redirect your own RRSPs into uh, this type of investment vehicle. So it's uh, it's a passive investment. So if I went to my bank and said, I want so I have a mortgage, right? I have a house. So I, that means I can go to my bank and say, I want to take out a second mortgage to make money. Like, is that how it You wouldn't want to do that. Well, first off, banks don't offer second mortgages. Uh, okay, so you could take out a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, okay. right? Okay. And so you make a spread. So the HELOC, usually they're around 4% interest rate. So if you're making 12, you're really netting eight, right? right? So yeah, a lot of people do do that though. Uh, they use the equity in their home. Okay. Um, maybe they'll use a HELOC or maybe they just refinance, right? Get a new mortgage at the end of their five-year term. They'll refinance at a lower interest rate than they had already. So they're borrowing two and a half percent and they'll still be making 12. You know what I mean? So there's an app for this. Uh, my brokerage, Smart Money Mortgages, as we get to the end of the presentation, um, if you go onto the Apple App Store, the Android App Store, and you download the Mopolo app, you're able to um, find my mortgage brokerage, Smart Money Mortgages. But the app allows you to do a lot of things. You can check your credit on there for free. Um, you can get pre-approved for a mortgage. You can look up the value of your home. Right? Uh, it even allows you to plug in certain specifics about your home, like renovated upstairs or you did certain additions it'll calculate that as well and add that and you'll see the value of your home um, you'll get mortgage rates <coughs> calculators a lot of different tools in that uh, in that app right so um, yeah if you have a moment just I'll go through the steps here so you look at in the app store the polo um, it'll ask you to enter it in order to put your information your credit you got to put in your name address date of birth so on right um, Type in smart money and find a broker in the first name section. And then find broker and you'll be able to uh, find me. So at this point, I'm going to take a few more questions while my colleague, Ivor Christopher, uh, sets up. Okay. Hey, what's your broker code? It's asking for a code or for your name. So it, first name, smart money. First name, smart money? Yeah, first name, smart money. So what is the difference between <coughs> going with the fee leverage and may not use that stress test who may allow you to qualify for more and the benefits of going with, let's say, a bank who utilizes that stress test? To go to a B lender, you actually need 20% down. That's the major difference. So I don't know if a first time home buyer would be able to utilize that, but yeah, that would be um, the first step in circumventing the, um, the stress test, right? Um, Back to the, the original part of the quote, the couple making two hundred thousand dollars should be able to qualify for a lot more than three hundred grand. Yeah. Wait, we need that. I don't. Does um, job stability have to be credit for it to start with that? It does. So let's say that one of those uh, individuals is still under probation. The bank is not going to give them the money yet. Um, or 
if the person is paid hourly, they would have had to have been in that job for two years if they're not getting guaranteed hours, right? So there are a lot of particulars that go into the income that I'd have to see to see, okay, does it really qualify? Because it sounds like good income, but if it's not salary and it's hourly, and we need to look at T4s, but they've only been there six months, yeah. they might not qualify as bank, right? Um, but yeah, to help first-time home buyers, there are some programs out there. Like, the government just announced a new one that they're giving 5% on resale homes or 10% on brand new homes to first-time home buyers, right? Um, so there are some criteria that they'd have to meet. Like, I think the max income there is 120000 right? Oh. And they're limited to four times that 120 in terms of purchase price. Okay. So they can only buy up to 480000 right? Um, but yeah, if they do meet the criteria and they want to buy like a pre-construction home and they have 5%, the government will give them 10%, which means that, that the mortgage will be smaller and should be easier for them to qualify. Make sense? Uh, beyond that, there are actually some municipalities that help first-time home buyers. So Dufferin County and Central County, they have programs where they'll give you the entire down payment, 10% um, towards uh, the purchase of an existing home, right? Um, the criteria there, you gotta live there. Uh, you gotta make under like $93,000 a year in good faith, right? Um, that's basically it, and they'll give you 10% uh, for the down payment on the home. So there are some government programs out there to help, but um, to get into the real specifics, have them call me. You know what I mean? I can, I can help you. Or if it's downtown. Yeah. So anywhere so near downtown, bedroom. you're looking yeah. at a one bedroom condo costing about 550000 yeah. and you're going to need income of about 110000 for that. So, were there any more questions? Go ahead. Um, you talked about um, getting, uh, getting to pre construction, is like a really great way to, like, uh, to invest. Yep. So, I've gone to like, a couple of like, presentation oh. centers, but I find, even though I own my condo, Yeah, so you can, depending on how much you owe on your condo, right. how much it's worth, you could get a home equity line of credit for that uh, those payments that you got to meet for the builder. Right. Um, depending on how close you are to the end of your mortgage term, you can refinance and get the liquid cash out that way. Right. Um, those are the two. Two ways. Yeah, pretty much. Generally, yeah, refinance. Refinance. Because it's yeah, it's, it's a lower interest rate. It's a lower interest rate. Um, but the home equity line of credit adds more flexibility. So I mean, just like any line of credit, uh, if you don't use it, you don't pay anything. If you do use it and you pay it off, you can redraw on it again. So it's and that's going to be based on regular equity yeah. based on the property assessment and market value. So we use an appraisal. So uh, that's a different professional who's licensed as an appraiser, goes out there, takes measurements, takes pictures, and then compares it to three or four of the most recent sold houses in their area that are comparable in size and so on. Gets a value, and we go off that value. So the property tax assessment? No, no, we, never, <laughs> we don't use a property tax assessment. The question was whether or not the HELOC, Home Equity Line of Credit, is better than the uh, refinance option, right? And it kind of does, does depend. Refinancing, if you have good credit, will get you a lower interest rate, right? But the HELOC is has its advantages because it's so uh, flexible. All right, ladies and gents, my name is Ivan Christopher. I run a firm called Integrity Accounting Services here in Toronto. I'm a chartered professional accountant, and I've been doing this for over 30 years. I specialize in um, personal and corporate tax returns. We're going to talk about the tax implications of investment and rental properties. I'm going to cover four main topics. This is something that my clients over the years who have rental property have asked me or have learned the hard way and then come to me afterwards. What do I do? Okay. So we're going to 
talk about what you can and cannot claim. We're going to talk about understanding the principal resident exemption. Very important. Next question I get quite frequently, should I incorporate or not? Okay. And then last is HST on real estate and new homes. Okay. So expenses you can and cannot. There's a lot of expenses you can. You know, advertising, insurance, management fees. We have a management firm that's doing it for you. Professional fees. You have to pay somebody like me to do your accounting for you. Travel expenses. So if you are you know, Kevin mentioned that you have property in, you bought a property in uh, St. Catharines, Niagara Falls. Every month you've got to go traveling, or every other month. You have to travel, you've got to fix it. You can write off your expenditures of your traveling, your mileage, your gas. All right? There's some people who have property out of the province, out of the country. Every now and then they've got to travel down there to write that off. Telephone expenses. Right? You got to communicate with these people in St. Catharines and wherever else. So you can write off part of your phone bill. Everybody now has a cell phone bill and a good long distance plan, but you can still write that part of that off. Repairs and maintenance. Now you notice on the other side, what you cannot claim is renovations. I'm going to tell you the difference. Repairs and maintenance. There's a flood. You got to replace the tiles. That's repairs and maintenance. The roof needs replacing. That's repairs and maintenance. Renovation is, I want to upgrade the, the kitchen. I want to upgrade the bathroom. That's renovation. That you cannot afford. Utilities, property taxes, mortgage interest, and the government has decided they'll let you do landscaping. Because some people think that's renovation. Like landscaping, you have a landscaper come back, comes by every couple of months, does stuff or whatever. You can write that off. Sorry, you think it's the one that comes in every week? Or even every week. Yeah. You can have that written off. Main things you cannot write off, the principal portion of mortgage payments. This is a, a common um, myth that the people who buy rental property things they can write off. They can write off the whole part of the, the mortgage payments. But for example, I've had a client, you know, their their rental property, it's a negative cash flow. So they think they're at a loss. And then when I do the tax return, they have an income. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm losing money. I'm like, no, you're not losing money. Not according to CRA. <laughs> right? Because you cannot write off the principal portion of your mortgage. So, for example, um, I have a, a rental property. My mortgage is fifteen hundred a month, and I have my utilities and everything else is another five hundred. So it's two thousand dollars. I'm total out of pocket, right? And I'm renting it for eighteen hundred bucks, right? So I'm negative cash flow, I'm two hundred dollars a month, right? However, of that fifteen hundred dollars, um, say five hundred dollars is principal. So now I've got a thousand dollars interest in taxes. I've got three hundred dollars. Utilities and utilities that I'm charging back. So I'm collecting 1800 bucks, but according to CRA, my cost is only 30. So I have $500 of, um, sorry, 18, sorry, $300 of income according to the Revenue Canada a month. I have now have to turn around and Pay taxes <laughs> on my tax return on those three hundred dollars, even though I am technically a lot of pocket. But you cannot, you cannot um, claim the principal portion. And renovations, as I mentioned, those are stuff that are not required. 
Now, if you are buying, people want to sometimes buy fixer uppers. So if you buy a fixer upper and you know you're gonna say, okay, you know what, I bought it for two hundred thousand and I'm gonna fix it up over the next two, three years. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, and then in three years, I'm gonna sell it for five hundred thousand, make a three hundred thousand dollars profit. I'm gonna spend a hundred thousand over three years and sell for five. So I'm gonna make two hundred thousand dollars now. All right. Well, CRA is going to say, well, that 100000 that you spent, you cannot write off because you're increasing the value of the property. It's not a repair. However, if you buy a property, the same property, and you go to a, you know, a contractor and says, I'm going to give you $100,000, 100, you borrow it from the bank, I'm going to give you 100000 I want you to fix the house. Before I take um, occupancy, fix it, and then we're good. CRA will say it's not so much a repair now. I mean, a renovation. You just you've increased the value of the um, the house. So now, when you go to sell the house, even though you bought it for two hundred, the cost is going to be three hundred because you sell two hundred to buy it, a hundred thousand to fix it. So what they call the ACB, the adjusted cost base, is now three hundred thousand. So those, that's the difference in terms of uh, repairs and renovations. Actually, before uh, we move on to that, the next topic, so any question on, on any of these? <coughs> what you can and cannot. Basically, anything to do with the property that's coming out of your pocket, you can. One of the things also you got to be mindful of is if you are occupying that property. If you are occupying it, right, so you're living in this property and you're renting out the basement, as Kevin mentioned, um, you only get to write off a portion of those expenses. What if you're creating the basement apartment? So I live upstairs, I just renovated the basement. What portion of creating that basement can I submit for next year? Okay, so the renovations you don't get to write off, mm -hmm. but now you have no, no, not even landscaping, the walkway. The landscaping you can, but the renovation. Sorry, landscaping. I mean, like I created a walkway down the front to the backyard, cement, interlock. Well, you could get creative and say that's repairs <laughs> or landscaping, right? You get creative and you push the envelope certain ways, but uh, technically, if you are, if you decided, like for example. You're going to take the basement and you're going to put in a um, bathroom, kitchen, all that sort of stuff. That's renovation. Okay. You don't get to write that off. Okay. And now your income, you claim it 100% the income, but the expenses, all these expenses here, unless it's specifically directed towards the, the unit, you have to allocate it or prorate it. So you look at the hundred percent of the house. If the basement is twenty percent of the house, then you only get twenty percent of the expenses to write off, unless you can prove that it's, that expense is directly related to that unit. So if I had a, if I was doing a basement apartment like you were talking about, I would do what Kevin mentioned. I would get a, a meter for that, so that you could say, okay, that meter is specifically for that unit. So hundred percent of that expenses. Is for that unit. Okay. Any other questions? This is all for. Uh, Sorry. This is not personal tax or something. Right? Well, yeah, personal because you know, I'll get to incorporation okay. later. That's the next topic, but most likely, ninety percent of the time, you will be declaring your rental income on your personal T ones. Right. So when you go to do um, your taxes, do it yourself. You know, when you fill out the form, there'll be one say rental income, you go in, you fill in on all the information. If you hire somebody like me, I'm gonna ask you all the questions of okay, how much did you spend on this? How much did you spend? I'll ask you actually I'll ask you for a spreadsheet. I'll have you fill it out and give me a spreadsheet. Um, but then you know, it, it, there's a special form, a T seventy seventy six, which is a statement of rental income. You go in there and you fill that all in. And you get taxed or your income reduces if it's a loss. 
based on the net result. So here's an interesting um, section that a lot of people are not really familiar with, but the laws have changed recently, and it's, um, it's very interesting when you have multiple uh, prop, um, properties. So that's principal residence exemption. Now, up until 2016, if you had multiple properties, the government would allow you to designate what your principal property was, even if you weren't living there. So say, for example, I had a property in Hamilton, and I have a property in St. Catharines, I live in Toronto. All right? Now, if I know my property in Hamilton is going to appreciate at a certain rate, same with St. Catharines, and I live in Toronto, and I know that the values in Toronto is going through the roof, then I want to designate my principal prop principal residence as Toronto because that's where I'm going to get the most bang for my buck. Because when I if I sell my house in Toronto, because it's my principal residence, you're exempt from capital gains. But up until 2016, they could tell you, oh, I could say for 2015, my principal residence was Hamilton. For 2017, my principal residence was St. Catharines. They allowed you that flexibility to designate principal residence. And then when you sold those property, you would have to prorate the capital gain. So you got to manipulate that system. And people became very good at it. And some people got really rich doing it. And they closed that loophole in 2016. So they came up with new rules in terms of the designation of principal residence. And the five categories is one per family, meaning that you only, could only one, um, well, I'll get into it. These are the five. Must inhabit the home. You have choices. You cannot earn income and restriction on the amount of land. So, Principal resident, one per family. In a family unit, only one person can designate the property as a principal resident. So I'm married, my wife, my son, it has to be over 18, right? Between my wife and I, we can only designate a property per year as our principal property. So it can't be like, Principal residence. You can't be, say, you have two houses, or this is the scenario I just gave you have three houses, and I'll say, okay, babes, I'm going to claim this year Toronto as my principal residence. You could claim Hamilton as your principal residence. You can't do that. It was able to do it before. You can't do it now. All right? So only one person in that family unit could claim principal residence. You must. Inhabit the home. This is where they really clamp down. As I said before, before 2016, I didn't have to live in that house. All I had to do was own it. And I could declare it as my principal residence. But now they're saying you have to inhabit it. There's no minimum period, so you can literally inhabit that home for a couple of days. All right? Because I have a client, they own a home in Hamilton, and they rent in Scarborough. They've designated their place in Hamilton as their principal residence. It's a rental property, so every now and then they're over there. But because they're there a couple of days, a month, or whatever, they can declare that as their principal residence. If they didn't live there at all, if they didn't occupy that property at all, even though they owned it, it would be considered an investment property, they won't get the exemption, they would have to pay capital gains. All right. So CRA now, but they CRA, as you guys know, they will they will look at all the evidence, including your length of time of the dwelling, and all that sort of fun stuff. Your income, patterns of buying. So if you're one of these people who constantly flipping houses back and forth every year, they'll look at that to determine if this is 
truly a principal residence, or is this a business that you've created to flip homes? Go ahead, Sam. Can I flip every year? Can I flip my principal residence every year? Can I make money every year by flipping? You can flip every year if you want. If you want to go and buy a new house every year, mm -hmm. there's nothing that says you can't do it. What? Um, as long as the financial institutions will allow you, there's nothing that says it. But you have to dwell in that house. Well, at one point, will they consider it a capital gain because I, I keep being no. a nomad? As long as you could prove that you lived in that house. At one point, they said you have to live in a year, six months, or house, in, have to live in a house for six months to a year. There's no minimum period. So I guess that was part, I think you partly answered, how do you prove it? How do you prove it? Well, I guess like how you prove it, some of the other places that you have to get, um, what do you call it, bills, utility bills, and stuff like that coming to, to your name, um, driver's license, passports, whatever it is, um, your, 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 your pay slip. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how to determine it. I'm pretty sure those are the common ways to determine, you know, if you have kids, if the kids going to school in the area. You know? If you are living, if you have a property in Hamilton, and you live in Toronto, and you claim Hamilton is your principal, principal uh, residence, but your kids go to school in Toronto. Right? Any other questions on that? You have choices. They will allow you to uh, claim um, residence if you own a cottage. A lot of people <coughs> have cottages up north, the Skokia and so on and so forth. And when you go and you spend summers in your cottage. So they're saying, well, we're going to allow you to claim your cottage as a principal residence. Right? If you so desire. But sometimes, you know, it might be lucrative to take that um, exemption on the property in uh, cottages. Cause I, I saw prices of cottages here. I don't know how people can afford those. They're ridiculous. <laughs> I looked at the price of a cottage in Muskoka, and I looked at the price of a house uh, in, in Jamaica, and I'm like, Jamaica, Muskoka, Jamaica, Muskoka. Mm. <laughs> so, um, they are going to allow you to do that. So, for example, if you own a property from 2006 to 2015, but you only occupied the, that property in 2006, 2007, you can only designate it as your principal residence for those two, ye for those two years. All right, so again, um, I have this cottage, right, and I owned it from 2006 to 2015. I occupied it in 2006-2007 after that, I rented it out for an Airbnb or whatever. I rented it out. So now, it's 2015, I want to sell it, right, I'm going to sell it. I can only designated as principal property in 2006 and 2007. The other years, I have to pay capital gains on that. Okay. Okay. And to make it even more confusing, right? when determining the amount of your exemption, you can add in. They let you add in a freebie year. Why, I don't know, but they, they allowed you. So now instead of two years, you can get three, but that's at your choice. You make that election. Because remember, the, whatever year you, do, you uh, do designate this other property as um, principal residence, you cannot claim for your true principal residence. So in that same scenario, Right? I owned that uh, cottage from 2006 to 2015, and I sold it, and I claimed it for those two years. In the meantime, I'm at my principal residence, and then I decided to upgrade 
and then next year I sold my principal residence, I cannot, I can only claim it for 11 years. Because I can't use those two years that I claimed principal residence on the cards. You can't have two places as principal residence in the same year. So that's why you have to look where you can get the most bang for your buck. So if you think your property in the Muskokas it's, has appreciated way more than your property at, in Toronto or Mississauga, then I will take the principal, principal um, residence exemption on my property in Muskoka. Because then it's appreciated more. That means that's more I do not have to pay capital tax on to the government. Any questions on that? Okay. Your property is not supposed to be set up for something to make money. That's Tony Gaines, what Kevin just said, but in the eyes of CRA, your principal residence is not made to make you money. <clears throat> so you cannot, in this example, you know, you can't go and buy a sixplex. Right? <laughs> Live in one of the units and, and then sell and says, hey, that's my primary residence. You know, it's like five other units. Right? You may get exemption on your one unit, right? But you will get on the whole. So they're gonna look at that when you uh, do a primary um, when you deem your uh, residence as a primary residence for the exemption. So if you live in a residence and oh you set up a basement apartment, they're cool with that, all right? But if you set it up and you're the one living in the basement and you're renting out the rest and you're pocketing a good coin every month, you basically say living for free. They won't look too favorable on that. Mm -hmm. They may say no, that's not a part of your residence, and you maybe you know they'll tell you to pay a capital gains on the sale. Yeah. If, um house and say you rent the basement. Is there a percentage like if the renters pay sixty percent of your mortgage every month? Mm -hmm. Is that what you can is there like a something they look at to say, well you know, you know, you're paying less than your rent or so then you can't claim your you can't what they would do is probably maybe look at the square footage, see how much you are taking, how much the other and, and they'll know that because you would have claimed that in your um, in, in your tax returns, right? Because in your tax returns, you have to claim how much is your personal portion. Repeat the question. Okay, so the question, so, repeat the question, sorry. Uh, the question was, if you're renting your basement, you're yeah. living on the main floor or whatever, um, and you're renting out the rest of your apartment, mm -hmm. you have to pay more than 50% of your own mortgage, mm -hmm. does that count against you, or can you claim this still, or do you have the exemption? Um, again, it would go, they would take a look and see how much of a percentage is. If you are, you know, living in 60% and you're renting out 40%, that's fine because guess what? You've paid um, taxes to them on the rental income when you file every year. So they're going to look at it and again, it will say on your return what percentage is personal, whether it's 60, 40, 80, it will say. So they'll already know going in, in their mind, whether they think it's, you know, eligible for a principal residence exemption. Okay. Restriction on the amount of land. So if you buy a farmhouse, a 10-acre farmhouse, CRA only allows you to claim principal residence on maximum 1.2 acres of land. All right? The rest you will have to pay capital gains on. Unless you can prove to them that it's a working farm and that it's needed as part of the enjoyment and use of the property. Right? So they limit the amount of land that you could have and claim as, as a principal property exemption. So if you know 
one of you guys win the Lotto Max, and you want to go and buy that huge uh, property and house, and it's on five or ten acres, and then later on sell it, right? They're only going to allow you 1.2 acres. 1.2 acres is, is that's, that's a big house. That's a big lot. That's a good size lot. Right? If you can, if you if you're on 10 acres, you ain't, you you're not hurt. Right? But just to let you know, they they max they, they only allow you to max the 1.2 acres. Because then you could go like what was happening is people would go and they speculate and they buy up all these farmer lands, right? Oh yeah, I'm going to buy that 10 acre lot. I'm going to buy that 15 acre lot. I'll buy that 20 acre lot. And then when they sell it for millions to the developers, oh, that was principal property. No capital gains. No capital gains. And they're selling it for millions, right? So that was one way of the government closing that loophole. To incorporate or not, this is a question that I get asked quite frequently. Okay? So one of the things that are advantages of incorporation, and that means that you're, you want to create an incorporation, so you want to buy the property and put it under the incorporation so that, you know, for whatever reason, you think that's a better way. Okay? So the advantages of incorporating, limited liability and creditor <clears throat> protection, meaning if anything goes wrong, they can't, Whoever who is suing you for whatever reason, they're limited to assets of the corporation. So if I had five properties, right, and two of them are in my corporation, or one of them is in my corporation, the rest are on under me personally, something happened in that one that's run by the corporation, they can't come after my other four properties. They can only, or even me personally. They can only deal with the assets of the organ of the corporation. Income, corporate income is taxed at a lower rate than personal. Personal, the minimum is at 20%, and then it ratchets up to about 45% as your what we call your marginal tax rate. Right? Starting off at 20%. Right? Corporate starts off at 15. And you have to go really high to get into the 17 and 20 percent taxable rate. You have to be over a quarter of a million dollars in income. While personal, all right, if you're over 50, you're at the 27 percent. All right? So you're looking, or oh, sorry, over 40, sorry, you're at 27%. So 27% at 50, 15%. You're saving 12% in income. So that's one of the way people want to do this. And then also, one of the great things about corporations is the flexibility as to when income can be distributed to yourself as dividends, because you know you're, you're investing. Eventually, you want that money back, and the best way to do it is dividends, right? Because dividends is taxed at a lower rate than investment uh, employment income, okay, or other income. Investments is, is, is taxed at almost at the same rate as capital gains. Taxed at a lot lower rate. So if you're going to take out money from a corporation and you're part owner, you want to take it out in dividends. Because if you take it any other way, you have to declare that income and you're going to be taxed at the 27%. So those are the advantages of the corporation. The disadvantages, and this is what a lot of people, you know, I'm not aware of this, and I have people, yeah, I incorporated. I'm like, D were you aware of the costs? And they're like, no. I'm like, okay. So, first thing, if you transfer property 
from your personal holdings to your corporations, it may be deemed a sale, and you will have to pay capital gains on it. So I opened up a, a corporation. I have three properties, and I want to put them in my corporation because the corporation is a separate entity according to CRA. That's deemed a sale. It's not a transfer. That's a sale. And then they'll say, okay, what's the fair market value on those properties? You have to pay capital tax on the difference. So now all of a sudden, you got this tax bill that you got to pay. So watch out for that. So if you're going to do a start a corporation, whatever it is, you buy. You use it to buy properties. You don't use it to transfer properties. You use it to buy properties. Then there's a cost to set up corporations and the annual reporting, which are expensive. Okay? To set up a corporation is not that is not so much the actual fee, but then you have to employ a lawyer, probably a tax accountant, and we're not cheap. So there's that bill. Annual reporting. The cheapest I do a Annual report for a corporation is about seven fifty a year, right? and that's cheap. That's not bad. There are it's the normal fees are around fifteen hundred bucks for just a basic a basic corporate tax return. All right? It could get a lot more expensive, especially if you're bigger. All right. If you're a big corporation, you're talking tens of thousands. Okay? And because you are a corporation, you ha your financial record keeping is more stringent and thus more costly. You cannot, well, you can, but if you want to go to your accountant with a shoebox, you can, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. <laughs> So it's best that you keep your record keeping in a, in a good order. And that may mean having to hire somebody like myself to keep your record keeping in place so that when the time comes, your record keeping, your records are nice and clean. And also if, you know, CRA comes knocking, hey, I want to check out some of these expenses, right, you can easily have the documentation. Because right? as you guys know, you guys are with the, with the Canadian government. If you don't have your documentation, you're screwed, right? Yep. You're screwed. So you've got to make sure your documentation is in place. So are there any questions on incorporation or not? Because, right? again, that's one question I get asked all the time. Right? Me, personally... For me, I would do it because I could do my own tax returns. I can incorporate, I know how to incorporate, I've done incorporation, so I can incorporate and do my own tax returns. It's not going to cost me anything. But if I had to dole out 1500 bucks every year, plus whatever, to maintain, I, I, I think about it. The last topic we're going to talk about is HST. On, re, on, say, uh, on sale and purchases of real estate, right? So, <clears throat> great news. Uh, resale homes are HST exempt. So when you buy or sell a, a resale home, there is no HST, except on the services. The accountant, the lawyer, the real estate agent, there are HST on their services, but there is not HST on the actual sale of the property. Okay? Bad news, HST is levied on new sale homes. Okay, so Kevin was talking about pre-construction. There's HST on that, 13% of that. So you got your house, you're buying a $500,000 house or whatever. Besides all the closing costs, 
put 13% on top of that. Okay? Alright? However, you can apply for a new home HST credit. It's only up to a maximum of $30,000, which is basically $400,000. Now, you say $400,000, you can barely buy a house in Brampton or anywhere else for $400,000. Then you're going to put it up to $400,000, which is why it's only $30,000. So if you buy a house for $600,000, $700,000, there's going to be extra HST, which you have, unfortunately, to pay. With the, because the HST credit, the rebate, will not cover it. Right? It only does 70%, 75% of the PSD, which is 24000 a maximum of 24000 and then the federal rebate is all up to a maximum of 6000 So you have up to a maximum of $30,000 that you could rebate or, you know, exempt off that, um, off that sale or off that purchase. Now, one of the things that a lot of builders are doing is instead of you having to finance, because yeah, you're going to have to finance that, right? So instead of having you finance, they will allow you to transfer the rebate to them. So then they'll knock it off the price. So that way you don't have to cash flow. They will. Right? However, if you are buying a new home as a rental property, as Kevin was talking about, can't do that. The government, the federal government will not allow you to transfer that HST. You will have to apply for it under the NRRR, New Rental Property Real Estate, something like that. Anyways, the rebate. New rental property rebate. And you will have to wait for that. So you buy the house, it's going to be a rental property. The, the builder can't, can't, you can't transfer over the rebate. You have to file the rebate yourself. And then you have to wait. So you have to cash flow. Well, the same. Yeah, same both thing. Both, 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 both. Yes. So can you get that, or can they get use that thirty thousand as a deposit for your property? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. The deposit is something you have to actually pay for. Yeah. yeah, that's their security that they're going to preserve that property for you and not sell to somebody else, right? So that does actually have to come from the property. Yeah. Can you guys repeat the question for the record? So if that. Thirty thousand could be used as a deposit. So no, it's 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 HST payable. It's tax payable. So the builder has to pay that to the government, right? So it's not a deposit because they have to physically pay to the to the government, and then the government will a couple months later send it back to you as a rebate. So you're gonna have to cash for that, unfortunately. If it's a rental, if you're buying it as a rental but property. But if it's not a rental. If it's not a rental, then you could transfer the rebate to the builder. To the builder. So, so it's, it's in and out, right? And then they'll reduce the what, what you owe them by the rebate, right? Because they're, they're paying it to the government, and they're getting the rebate at the same time. Yeah. So Question. So you have up to $400,000. you are eligible for up to 400000 even if your house is over that. So if your house is worth 800000 you're eligible for the exemption up to uh, 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 up to four hundred. Right? Then so again, I bought a house for five hundred thousand dollars. Right? So my HST on that is sixty five thousand dollars. Okay? Sixty five thousand dollars. I'm only gonna get thirty. Well, yeah, you'll have it in the agreement. 
I'm not too cognizant on the how the agreement will be set up, but it will be an agreement that you know this is what your HSP is because they'll they'll have it. You know, this is how much the cost is, and I think this is the HST, and then they'll have the rebate. So I guess, it out. I guess my question is, I'm most focused on automatically Like, if here's somebody who's just going in and they're clueless about this HST, well, why? they would probably inform you, okay. and then they would ask you, do you want? To transfer the rebate because you have that option. You can say yes. You can say no. Why you would say no, I don't know. But you can say no, in which case you would have to apply for the rebate directly to the government and wait for the rebate. But you would have to pay the HSP. And is there a certain, so let's say, let's say somebody goes home and they look at their purchase period and it's not there. What do you mean? What's not there? Well, let's say, because you're saying the 30000 if you ask, like typically they'll inform you. Well, right. on your on your agreement, yeah. right? The HST will be there. So you bought the house yeah. for five hundred thousand, right? And then you have an HST. So, so the buyer is going to cover that when it goes up. But but generally speaking, builders will automatically include that rebate, right? right. Um, and you will see it. Now their purchase and sale agreements are very thick, yeah. but it will be in there. And your real estate lawyer will ensure that it's in there. Oh. All right. Um, and here are things that are eligible for the HST rebate. Because it's not just um, the construction of a new property. And the first one is a construction of a home. Condo. You decide to build a home. Right? You bought land, and then you decide to build on top of it. Right? If you're building, you're going to be charged HST by the by the tradespeople and materials, so you could take a rebate against all that HST up to thirty thousand. Okay, um, you con well you construct you contracted somebody to build a house. Same thing. Uh, you substantially renovated your house or condominium. So you bought a an old house, you demolished it, or you you gutted it and you renovated it. Right, you significantly again. You bought in trades, you bought in materials. You could get a rebate of about thirty thousand. Added a major addition to your home, right? Or you built your home because it was destroyed by a fire or hurricane or whatever. You bought shares in a newly constructed corporate housing project. That was something. I wasn't too aware of, but that's what's there. And you converted a non-residential property into a home. So you bought a commercial property, you got rezoned, and you built a residential house. So those are the options where the HST rebate is eligible. Okay? So it's not just on a newly constructed, because there are things you may do that will where you would incur HST costs. When it comes to Still, you still have to build it. You have to pay tradesmen to work. You have to pay for the materials. So it'll be prorated based on. So there, there'll be HST. It's more, um, you have to basically do like an HST return, right? Here's how much I paid in HST. You know, here's the rebate, seventy-five percent, and if it and you max out at thirty. Any other question? I thought I saw something else. Questions? Okay. You know how sometimes you see like somebody will sell like their home to a family member for like a dollar? Mm -hmm. What is that all about? Sir? Okay. So actually we're in the Q&A, so that's perfect timing. <laughs> so before, I just want to thank you for your time. But um, so selling it for a dollar. Okay. You can sell it for a dollar. But when it comes time to tax time, CRA says, we don't, we don't care. They will deem, they will say it's a sale, and then they will ask you. They're not asking you. They will find out what the fair market value is. All right? And then they will say, okay, here's the fair market value. Here's what you bought it for. You have to pay capital gains on the difference. All right? So it's not a, something that works. No, it doesn't work. Okay. 
children. That is a good way of doing it. I was just about to. Huh? I was going to mention that because my grandmother bought a house, the house I'm living in right now, for twenty five thousand dollars. We live in downtown Toronto. Bought it almost over forty years ago. Twenty five thousand. That's what I was talking about. She bought it for twenty five, and back then that was a lot of money. Right? Single woman, she bought a $25,000 house, Dufferin St. Clair. Now it's probably worth about $1.2, $1.5 million. She passed away about seven years ago. Seven years ago, exactly. Now, normally, we would have to pay a state tax, which is more or less the same thing. You pass away, it's deemed the sale, and the... It becomes part of your state, and your state is charged tax on that capital gains. We got around that. My grandmother had the foresight a long time ago. She put my mother on title a long time ago. So then when she passed away, full title went to my mother. It's not doing the sale. You can discuss it more with the lawyer, but I'm just telling you, I'm talking yeah. from personal experience. She added my mother, right? So now my mother in title the house, and my mother, being the smart woman she is, she learned from her mother. Myself and my sisters are now on title. Can you add somebody under 18? I'm not sure about that. You have to ask the lawyer, but you can add people to the title. You know, like for example, we're from Trinidad. We've had, you know, ancestral homes in Trinidad, and it just goes from one family member to the next. Now the property laws there may be a little bit different, but one thing we made sure in our family is we put the kids on the title when they become of age. So therefore, you don't have to pay any of that estate tax. I'm Dumar Kumar Hewitt. I'm a lawyer. And I'm here to talk to you about the legalese of what most of my colleagues and friends would have discussed with you so far. The presentation is labeled private mortgages, but it also includes um, assignment, one of the topics Kevin asked me to, to, to cover. So I understand what we've been discussing so far. Private mortgages, you'd have, you already would have an understanding of exactly how that works. <clears throat> And then we move on to assignment sales. I'll walk you through that process so you also get an understanding of how that part works. Now, private mortgages, um, of course, we say private because not per se that it is private, but it's outside the ordinary lending institutions that we do know. It's outside the bank, the Schedule, schedule A and Schedule B institutions. So this is where you are going to, in some cases, an actual individual who is lending you monies and then we'll use your property to secure that loan. That's considered a private mortgage or through a trust company or some other form of uh, less institutionalized arrangement then. So it could be a number of persons who would have come together, created this company and they lend monies to you and they secure it against your home. So that's where we say private mortgages. That's what we're thinking about. Mortgages that are not coming to you from the bank. Um, there are regulations around the lending of person, lending money to persons. Yes, I can get up and lend somebody thirty thousand, a million dollars, if I could afford it as well. Uh, you know, there are regulations around that. If you're getting into the business of it, of course, you would need to be licensed. Um, the usual license, uh, you're going through the financial services uh, commission, and that's usually a two-year license that you'll hold. If you formalize it though and get into creating a company that does that. Uh, a trust company, you could get a license for a longer period of time, you know, go through the usual uh, legal regulations and create that formal arrangement so you can be in the business of lending monies to persons by way of mortgages. It's nothing different, I shouldn't say like that. It is a loan for all intents and purposes. The only difference in this case is that you're securing it against a home or some form of real estate. That way, you know, 
if everything goes bankrupt, at least, you know, there's a security. So if the person stops paying, then, you know, it's, it's against their home. I can recover at least some part of my, my initial investment. It says private lender slash investor because it depends on what part of it you are. If you are the person who is, well, on the other side, acting for the person getting the money, you're seen as a private lender. Um, but if you're just putting monies into that pool of funds that is passed on to these persons, then you're the private investor. So you can make the determination as to where you are. You could be, I give monies to this group, the group passes it on. So I'm not in the actual business of doing the legal document, passing on the loan. You know, I just want to contribute to the pool and they give me my return when the, when the funds are repaid. So, so that's why we have investor there. The general considerations, of course, um, when you're trying to decide getting into that business is whether you would be looking at just doing a regular conventional mortgage. A conventional mortgage is where you lend money to a person and they make their usual payments over a period of time, going through the usual course, or a collateral mortgage where I secure a set amount of sum against your property, for example. I recreate mortgage documents. I secure it against your land for $100,000, against your condo, against your home, whatever it is. But for right now, I'm only advancing you $30,000. Later on, you may choose to come back to me. I need another $10,000. I'll advance that to you. So I can go up to the 100000 ceiling that I've already registered against your property. But you may not need other funds right now. And actually, if you take it on now and, and you don't need it, the interest payments are higher. Well, the interest that's been accumulated on it is higher. The payments are higher. But you know, you take it over a period of time. It saves costs that way because I don't have to go back to creating brand new mortgage documents, securing it against your property, and you incur all the fees. And of course, the borrower in most of these cases incur all the fees for the loan. So, you know, it, 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 it helps the borrower if, if you do it that way. Uh, a, lot, a few restrictions to it, but generally speaking. We we'll then move on to assignment sales. These are the topics that we'll cover. Um, acquiring the property, I believe we would have already gone through acquiring, the, acquiring the, the new bill and going through that process, holding it for a period of time and then disposing of it. I'll leave that until we get to the end to save a little bit of time. So, assuming that you get into the business or the contemplating getting into business of lending, uh, the first thing that you'll be thinking of is how to secure your investment slash how to secure your loan. So whichever, I'm using the words <coughs> interchangeably. Uh, the ordinary way of securing it, or the most common, is of course a mortgage on the land. When we say land, we include houses, we include everything else. Just legal talk for something that just cannot be moved, as against something that can be moved. So you're securing it against the land by way of an ordinary mortgage, but there are a few other options that you do have to secure your interest as well. You can secure it against fixtures or chattel. Fixtures, legal word, I'll break it down. Fixtures are anything that is fastened to the house. For example, uh, so when a house is developed, one of the things that you actually do and being installed in the house, of course, is an HVAC. That's common. At the point the HVAC is now drilled in and installed and fixing the house, it now becomes a fixture. Idea is that it's not going to move again, so it's now fixed. As again, shuttles. So you can create a security interest in the fixtures that are in the house, all the things that are attached to the house. You can also create a security interest in the shuttle, the things that actually move in the house. Those include the furniture, the appliances. So you will get a general assignment uh, where the borrower is passing on that to you to say, everything that I own in my house, I'm giving you a security interest in it. It means that you have an interest in the fridge. You have an interest in the dishwasher. So when you get to that point where you're now trying to recover your sums and the bailiff goes in, they've already said to you, everything I own here is mine, I promise. They're not rented items, and you can rely on their word for that. The law does allow you. And you go in and you scoop, and then you sell to, of course, recover your sums. So these are, when we say security interest, those are the things that you're thinking of. And of course, assignments. You also do assignments for things that they don't yet own, but they intend to own in the future. One of those things, rents. There's someone living in the basement, someone living in the back of their house. They don't actually own that rental payment because it's theirs after the person lives it out. Uh, but they are assigning to you upfront to say, if I stop paying, you go to the tenant, the tenant now starts to pay that rent to you. That's a way of also securing your interest to make sure that, you know, some way, somehow, you get some monies, and that's how you go about making sure that you secure yourself. But now that you know, if you're on the other side, you know that that's what they'll be doing too, so you can look out for it. 
Uh, now, the other thing that you're thinking of is rank or, prior, or priority. Interchangeable words is where do you rank on the title of all the other securities that are on the, on the title. All right, so this is an example of some of the terms that would ordinarily come in a private mortgage. This mortgage is a third mortgage. A third mortgage means that this is the third person lending monies to this borrower and securing it against their property. So that's his or her rank. That's the, that's the lender's rank on this property. You have a rank, you decide whether or not I, oh, I would only do first mortgages, so I would only be, I have to be the first one going on your title, otherwise I'm not lending you money. Or I may take second, or I may take third, or I may take an unregistered interest where it doesn't really matter where I am, and I'm lending you monies, I have all these documents, I won't register it against the title, you know, but you know that if something happens, I'll step out and I'll enforce my security. So that's unregistered interest. Or you can be in a situation where all these security interests are already untitled. Uh, what I want to do before I advance money is ask all those persons to postpone their interest. And postponement means that they won't enforce. Um, so they'll allow you to step in a rank above them. So they'll postpone their interest and allow you to step above them just in case anything happens so you have a higher priority because you are paid based on your rank on title. If you're a third, that means there are two persons to be paid before you. And if the funds run out at number two, then you're out. So the ranking is very important. And another way to secure your interest, of course, title insurance. Uh, most lenders who are advancing funds will require you to get a lender policy. It means that if there's any defect in the title, you have an insurance policy to pay me out so that I can recover some of my funds that I've advanced to you. Fire insurance to make sure that it's indicated on your fire policy that I've advanced monies to you on the security of this house. So if the house, um, the heavens forbid, is destroyed, there you're indicated on the fire policy as one of the persons to be paid. Again, your rank is important because if the house was only valued a million dollars at the time it was destroyed and there is 1.2 and you're the third mortgage, we may run out of funds before we get to you. But just in case, you know, there is equity there, you fire insurance chips in to pay out whatever sums are owed to you. Less formal ways of registering or securing your interest, of course, lodgement of deeds, that's similar, it's, it's, it, that's coming from the old land title system, but you would have created all the documents, you'd have lodged it with the title's office without going through that formal process of having it be a mortgage on the title, but there'll be an indication on the title that there's someone else there that has a security interest in this property. And this is a general notice. Um, so it's less favorable, less persons use it. And of course, which we'll be more familiar with, the guarantees and indemnities, where you have friends, families, and everybody you can think of stepping to say, I'll guarantee this loan. If that person refuses or is unable to pay, then we'll act as their guarantor and you can claim against us through the usual course. We're all good on all these securities, right? And of course, because I'm a lawyer and we always have to club ourselves, but it's, <laughs> it's important to keep in mind three questions that you have to answer now that I remember. Uh, the involvement of the lawyer. So if the lawyer is acting for you as an investor, there are certain obligations that they do have. Of course, they have to have the authority to invest because you have to pass on the funds to them. At the time of the investment, you don't have to pass it ahead of time. They have the usual obligations to make sure that all the conditions that you have stipulated as it relates to securing your investment is there. So if you want the assignment on the rent, if you want everything in the house to be secured, to have a security interest in everything in the house, if you want to be on the title, all those things have to be there before they are, are passed on your funds. The usual disclosures that we're required to make to you and we're required to make to the borrower as it relates to the terms of the loan, we'll go through a few of those. And of course, reporting to you on almost everything that happens in the transaction, down to the cent. And that's, this is really a story I had the other day when I closed the transaction for someone and I got to the end of it the next day and I had nine cents in my account. And it was annoying. And I called him and he says, Damar, do not write my check for nine cents. And I say, the society says I have to go back to zero. And here I am writing it for a check, a bank draft for nine cents. It cost me more to write the draft for nine cents. Mm -hmm. But I had to write it and send it across because it was my error and I had nine cents sitting in my account. I know, right now, the last thing I do is write that final check until I see zero. Uh, okay, so we discussed these terms as it relates to the mortgage, 
the usual things that you'll see there. So this is someone who's a third mortgage lending $30,000. Um, number three, that would have been the company. Security is a property that they are holding it against. The interest rate, this is 11% roughly per month that they're charging this person. Um, lender fee, the borrower usually pays all the, all the lending fee. They have it for 12 months and the usual payments are $274. This means that it's interest only, which means that the $274 that this person is paying per month only goes towards the interest portion of the loan. You get to the end of the, you get to the, end of the 12 months, they'll still owe you $30,000. <laughs> They haven't paid anything, well. technically what it means. <laughs> uh, this is the, as it relates to improving your priorities. So you see that there is an M1 and M2. That means that there are two mortgages before you. And because I don't want to be a number three, just in case anything happens, I would have requested period amounts for M1 and M2, which is mortgage one and mortgage two. Take them off title so I'm now at number one. So that's the general thinking behind that. And the usual things there are the legal fees to do all of that. That is being charged by the private lender. They're charging you a rush fee of $423 because you want the statement in five days, which in my mind is not so rush, but uh, they say it's rush. And there's not much that you can do to, you could argue about it, but if you want to close the transaction, you just pay it and you move on with your, with your life. And, and all these other fees. And the per diem being, of course, the interest that you have to pay every single day, you don't make the, make the payment on, July 5. Some of the usual things that you do have to disclose when you are advancing funds uh, to a person. The terms of the mortgage, totally up to you. You determine exactly what are the terms if you are the investor slash lender. If you're on the other side, you don't have that much bargaining power, so you, you have to settle for it. Uh, standard mortgage clauses are things that, all the clauses that run with this type of mortgage, you determine what standard mortgage clauses you want to use. Um, for those of us who would have gone through the mortgage process, if the lawyers would have probably walked you through a standard mortgage clause. It's a really thick document. And it's called standard because we don't want to have to draft that document every single time we do a mortgage. So it's standard mortgage clause. It's registered with the land titles office. The favorite one for private lenders are 2033 because it's a very aggressive one. And it gives them a lot of powers. So they like to subscribe to 200033. Um, you'll see that in their document of the standard mortgage charge terms and basically gives them all the powers, general assignments, all of that over the property of the, of the borrower. The required disclosures, which we've just seen a while ago, the interest rate, you are required to disclose the interest rate. It has to be very clear in a way that it can be calculated on an annual basis. In this case, you see, saw that it was 10.99 10 per month. Multiply by 12, you get the annual figure. If you gave it another sort of way of calculating it, for example, 10% every three days, you probably wouldn't uh, satisfy the rule because it would be too difficult for an ordinary person to calculate on an annual basis. Uh, so you're required to do that. You're required to disclose your charges and fees that, that, that you're, that you're um, applying to this mortgage. The other terms that you get to determine, being on the investor side, of course, when you decide to pull together and get into the business, prepay, the payment obligations. Prepayment means that I'm lending you a mortgage on your title, I'm registering a mortgage for $100,000. You're only getting $80,000. I'm pulling back the other twenty dollars as prepayment. So you get $80,000. There is that security. You're not making any payments for the next year because I've already held it back. Uh, so that's prepayments. Interest only, which we have seen. You're only paying the interest. At the end of it, the principal has not moved. Regular payments, of course, is where we do, where the lender does that. Usual debit by prepayments. Sorry, by pre by post-dated checks or by prepaid authorization to take the funds from your bank account. You determine exactly how you go about collecting your funds, so that's option is there. And the usual, of course, are the penalty clauses, which is probably usually the biggest part of the document. There is a fee for almost everything. There's a fee for um, if you miss your payment, there's a fee if you ask us to change your payment date, there's a fee if you ask us to change your address, there's a fee for almost everything you can think of. It's it, 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 it gets, it adds up. So these are the usual, well, not the usual, some of the disclosures that you'll see in a document. So you'll see that they have an appraisal fee. You see the legal fees, and I should say, all these fees are being incurred by the borrower because the lenders don't incur a cost to pass on the debt to you. They're in the business to make money, not to incur, not, not to incur expenses outside of <clears> what <throat> they're required to do. So you are paying their lawyer fee. You're paying their commitment fee. 
you pay them an application fee, so you're paying a fee for quite a few things before you actually get that funds, and all that is actually coming out of the mortgage outside of a few of them that you have to clear out of pocket before you get the monies. So some of the standard form disclosures that you have to make as it relates to cost. And then you get to enforcing. Now this is hopefully good businessmen would not want to be here, but you have to really know how to enforce the security if it is that the loan um, goes into default. You have that option of selling the property by a private sale. There are strict rules as to how to go through that process, letting the person know that. But strangely enough, if the person is in default on their mortgage payment, the rules do not require you to let them that they're in default on their mortgage payment. The presumption at law is that you know that you've defaulted on your mortgage, so I don't need to tell you that you've defaulted on your mortgage. So that's clear. But everything else you do actually do require to give notice. So for example, if they rent out the house without telling you, which is usually a clause in many of these things, because I want to know if you're, if you're getting any additional funds, you're actually in breach. For that, I would need to let you know that you're in breach and give you some chance to fix it, reasonable amount of time. If you had not renewed the insurance on the house, that too, I would need to let you know. For mortgage payment, I actually don't have to tell you. The, the, the bank does let you know in these, in these circumstances, generally speaking, but there's no requirement that they do. Private sale, where uh, they would go through the process of taking you, well, advertising the house on the usual market and have it sold to someone else at arm's length, not one of their relatives. Uh, well, it can be the relative if you can show that it's a reasonable sale, but usually it's someone at arm's length, or going through the court process to have the property sold. Um, it's always preferable going through the court process. If the judge says you can sell it, nobody can challenge you. But of course, if you do it yourself, more questions will be asked. Oh, did you follow all these rules? So we like to rely on a judge because you can't blame it because the judge said it. Uh, foreclosures, of course, where you've gone through the usual process, you just can't sell the property. The market is down. It's not the best time to sell. It makes more sense for me to take over the house, move into it, rent it for a period of time, if so be it. Uh, but now is not a time to sell. So that's the usual process of foreclosure where you're actually not disposing of the property, you're taking control of the property. Or the usual quit claims process where the person now, they are the one who, who if they've quit their ownership of the house, they are the one who's actually paying you rent. They stay in the house, they recognize that you have a legal interest, they're paying you rent, going through the process. They've now moved from an owner to a renter, so to speak, if they want to continue staying there, or you can take them out to someone else and do any part of that, okay. Might have been a little bit fast, but I'm sticking to my half now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we spoke about taking possession, having the sheriff move in to, to, to enforce whatever powers you have, to take what you can take, sell what you can sell, um, to recover your debt. Rits of execution, if there's anything outstanding after you've gone through that entire process, in the sheriff's office, you put a risk a writ against Demar Kemar Hewitt, whatever Demar tries to do and they do a search, Demar owes it this debt and you want to make sure that debt is clear before you do anything else because they have an ownership over almost everything that Demar owns because that judgment is out there against him. We've gone through mortgages, now we're going through assignments. We've already gone through the new bill process, so I'm going to skip and save you some time on that. Um, let me answer the question as it relates to the new home rebate. So ordinarily, when the price is advertised for a new home, in the usual course, the price advertised to you take into account uh, a new bill rebate, the, the new home rebate. So when it comes to a lawyer, and this is a new home, we're looking for that, well, from we know it's a new home, we're looking for that rebate to be indicated in what we call the statement of adjustments. So you, the, house was, the house was advertised for $530,000 because the builder already knows that the actual price is 560, but you're getting that 30%, that $30,000, assuming that you qualify for the full amount, you're getting that $30,000, so that's why the price is advertised to you um, that way. So they've already worked, worked the, the discount into it for the new home rebate. Nobody says no, as I ever said, because otherwise you have to come up with that $30,000 to pay me, and I'm already struggling to come up with that 10% mortgage deposit, so I ain't coming up with $30,000 more. So, so that's what it is. So the lawyer looks out for it. You, it may not per se be brought to your attention, even though it should, because one of the documents you have to sign is the assignment of the rebate. So the lawyer would have explained to you what that is. But the lender probably, the builder 
won't spend a lot of time going through it because it's sort of by default that you will sign over that thirty thousand dollars uh, instead of waiting for it to go to the CRA and come back six months later to you. When when I mean, come on, ain't nobody have money to hold out for that. The other one was the transfer of title for two dollars. So uh, I know we said trans sale for a dollar or two dollars. In usually those cases, not a sale. Because if it's a sale, then that would flag it with this, with the CRA and flag it with title's office. It's more of a transfer of title. But we we put a dollar or two dollars because the law says consideration is sufficient, whatever is the figure. So if I paid you a dollar for something, even if it was worth a million dollars, you can't come back and to say that I undersold, undersold it to you. So that's why we put a dollar, even if actually no funds were paid. So a transfer of title is where you're moving funds from one person to another. Um, usually they're related some way, somehow. And that way the CRA will look past it um, and the ministry will look past it because we would have done that declaration to say either he was holding it on trust for someone else and uh, these are spouses adding, their, adding uh, their other spouse to the title or their parents, there's a mother, father, some form of relationship those persons can pass title to between each other without triggering um, the fair value clause because we have that relationship between them. Parties who are extremely at arm's length probably would have triggered that clause because we can't show a relationship between them. So there's a presumption that is for sale. And of course, the fair market value um, statements would kick in where you now have to show, well, I don't care that you sold it to him if you use that word sold. I don't care that you sold it in for two dollars. This house is valued at a million dollars, and you're going to pay your taxes on it for that. So the question is, if I want to pass title to my kids, how do I go about passing title to make sure that they uh, don't incur the CRA penalties? Then, all right. Uh, so one of the ways that was uh, proposed earlier, of course, is that you can do a transfer of title to add your kids to your title, as many of them as you want. You determine exactly how you want to add them. I know you did say that you wanted to pass to them on your death. Right. Passing to them require a certain number, a certain designation on the on, on the title means that you're doing it as a joint tenant, which means that once I die, whomever is left on the title automatically continues on the ownership, and they just need to indicate the fact on the title that I'm now dead, so I'm no longer owner. As against if you do it as a tenant in common, means that I'm only giving you 10% of my house. That means the 90% remains with me. That 90% does not pass to them on my death. So it remains on title to be distributed however you wanted it to be distributed, assuming that you did a will. If not, the law prescribes exactly how that should be distributed. How do you do to do that to make sure that they, so you avoid the tax consequences? Now you don't have, well you do have death taxes on your death if it is that you were not indicated on title as a joint tenant. You avoid that if you have somebody else on your title as a joint tenant who automatically steps in and takes over the full ownership of the property. There are some things to consider in that regard because if you have a mortgage to add someone, you'd need the bank's consent or the private lender's consent. Um, if that's, but assuming that you get around that, adding that person to the title in the usual course while you're alive, you know you can sign all the documents to say that I'm doing this willingly. No one is pressuring me. I'm adding this person to my title. He's my son, my daughter or my husband, or my wife, whatever it is. You do those documents while you're alive. You can pass title uh, without actually paying any, any funds. Putting someone on title like her child that's young, will it hurt his chances of getting so, a second property? So, 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 so that's a, that was, oh, that was my, my third question. <laughs> <laughs> so the third question, of course. So adding someone to title, it, this title system does require you to be at, as, at age 18. So, and, and the reason for that is below 18, there's restriction on your ability to contract. And so if you are passing title to someone, if, what, if you want to pass to someone under 18, the usual thing is to pass it to a trustee for that person. Uh, so there would be a trust document. So the question is adding someone to title who's under 18. Remember that Lance wants me to repeat the question. Um, so you pass it to a trustee, someone who's above 18, who's able to go through all the documentation to do it, uh, do whatever you want to be done based on that trust agreement. That's all. That's why they're on title. Uh, of course, it's someone you trust and someone you know would honor the agreements, the, the, the trust terms. So that's why you add some, to secure the interest of someone who is below 18. Because if you add someone who is below 18, you 
get to the point now where something happens to you, but they can't do anything because they're below 18, they can't sign any documents, none of this. Uh, so, okay, so the question is whether or not your children will pay taxes uh, at the time that they're inheriting whatever you've passed on to them. That's right? All right. So, uh, the beneficiaries, on, so one of the things, but Iva didn't consent, but Iva is probably more of the person for that than me, is your inheritance um, is tax exempted, exempt. So if money's coming to you right at that point when it's been passed to you, it's not taxed. So as a lawyer, when I'm doing, doing the administration, I'm transferring title to someone. I'm not applying any taxes or I'm not collecting any HST slash GST because I'm only required to pass it on based on how it is that. So the estate pays all the taxes at that point. So you'd have died, you'd have done your six months um, terminal tax. Well, not you, the person who takes over your estate would have done your terminal tax within that six months. And then they have another year after that to do, to pass everything that should be passed, finalize everything, and then do that final tax at the end of the one year administration period. They are the one who's paying the taxes on everything that you owned. And the reason for that is on death, you're presumed to have sold everything that you own. So the seller now is paying all the taxes um, that is required on the estate. And then the persons who are getting it, they're just getting inheritance with all the taxes already paid. So your son will not be paying any tax. We, um, the, trust would be the trust would not be paying any tax because you would have already paid the tax before you passed it to them. So, so that's, the, that's the estate duty. Sorry. You're going to be doing all this investment stuff like this. This is concerned. You should have a will. As Mark just pointed out, if it's in your will, then it's exempt. Right? Pass it on. But if you die without a will, then everything goes to your estate. And, it's, and as you just said, once you die, it's deemed everything is sold. And then if it's sold, there's tax. You know what that said. So if I, I have a will, but if I didn't have a will and I passed away and my house, you know, for my kids to get it, they would have to buy it. My estate would have to, take, well, not so much buy it, but it would be deemed a sale and my estate would have to pay taxes on, that's my grandma, she bought a house for 25, but she passed away for probably a million dollars. <laughs> so that's virtually, so that, that's, there was no, Will there if my mom, if my mom was retired, her estate would have to pay taxes on this million dollars. If you create a will, the person who is paying the taxes, and when I say you, it's not you, it's really your estate because you're no longer here. So the person, your sister in your case, that you've appointed as your executor and trustee, would go through the process of finding everything that you own, all the bank accounts that you hid because you didn't want your wife to know. Now she has to find them. Um, <laughs> and she has to put those together and then pay the taxes that should be paid on all those things because it's deemed that you would have sold everything. So you'd have sold your bank account unless you had um, your children on your bank account as well. If they're on your account as a signatory, usual joint account between you two, and you had not accounted for that in your will, there's a presumption that you intended them to take over the bank account. So all those things that you do have persons on jointly, there's a presumption that you intended for them to take it over, unless you had made some provisions in your will to the contrary. So your sister would have found everything that you owned. They would have paid the death taxes, the usual brackets, 0.5%, 1.5, 0.51, 1.5, 2, 2.5, if you're over $2 million. You'd have paid those usual taxes. And then after all taxes are paid, then they start the distribution. So they would have passed it on to your son, would have passed it on to whomever you would have wanted it to pass on to. Um, Iver's proposition, of course, is if you're already on if your son is already on title with you, then that's not something that needs to be accounted for in the will, and of course, it's not something that your sister would now need to pay taxes for. Because the other thing is, if it's in the will, it can be the will can be contested. Now that's going to go to court, da, 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 right? Even all that property is in limbo or whatever. If you're on title, as the said, you don't have to put that in your will. Right? But you have to be 18 if you're on title. Yes. 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 So it's it's more of a tax. Well, taking out taking yourself outside of the will, um, being a contested probate, it's a more of a tax discussion as to do I put them on now, so penalties are not paid at the end. 
or do I just leave it in my will? I don't want, because once you've added someone to the title, bear in mind that you now need their consent to do everything else with that property. Something to keep in mind. So, uh, but, you know, I'm quite okay adding them now so I don't have to worry about the additional taxes that come on my debt. What's the consequences of being on title, which was the question I was directing at Kevin? The consequence of being entitled is that once when you're, if you're already entitled, you no longer qualify for a first time home buyer benefit. The question is if the gains to be derived um, way outweigh that $8,000, then you know, you, so plus or minus, then you just add them to title because. Anything else? Uh, Let's say I'm untitled. Mom puts me on title. And now I have to, I want to buy a property. Is that going to affect me buying a property? It doesn't Other affect you. Person. It doesn't affect you. So if you're going into the debt service ratio, because if you are on title and there was a mortgage, assuming you're on mortgage, and that's taken into account as well, because most mortgage companies, if you're being added to title, now want you to either um, do a new mortgage arrangement or you be a part of the assumption of the mortgage. It means that now when they're going after the property, they have documents to say that you signed off on it, so I don't need to worry about your interest. You're just as liable under the mortgage. So that's taken into account if you want to acquire something new. This mortgage application that you have on this side is taken into account. Outside of that, it's you. Mom now no, no longer has the freedom to do whatever she wants. Because she may want to take a second or third mortgage. She can't do that without you signing You're off. And you, and you don't like private mortgages, so you'll not sign off on it. And then now she's stuck. The question <laughs> is, what's the benefit of adding them to title as against doing them in the will? Or should I do both? You can do both, um, but so you can do both. Uh, so sure if much is achieved by doing both, but if you just want to be safe and make sure that you know their name is absolutely everywhere, you can't have any doubt that they're the one who's supposed to get everything I have. There's no harm in that. It's as it relates to the tax consequence part of it. Things that don't fall in the estate, there's no taxes on them. And if you're on title as a joint holder with someone that does not fall in the estate, so there's no tax on it. So that's one benefit of adding them to title in, up while you're alive. So an intervivus transfer would mean a transfer while you're alive as against a transfer that happens after you're dead. Because for it to happen after you're dead, the presumption is that on your date of death, you would have sold it to them. So that's what you're paying taxes on. So you're paying taxes on that, yes, for every, or the sale that happens on your date of death. So having a will, if I didn't add to anyone's title, having a will would be circumvent that? No, oh. because the will only tells where the thing should go. It does not protect you against any taxes. Okay. Uh, sorry, yeah, if there was a, any, the will only says, I want my daughter to get my house, okay. and I want my son to get the four cars, and they can split the cottage. But they're still having to pay taxes on that sale. <laughs> yes. Oh yes, the God. will only, sorry, yeah, I should have made that clear. The will only tells where things should go. It okay. does nothing else. Okay. okay. And it tells, you know, uh, where you have younger kids, it tells, you know, I want this person to be, to take care of them, to be their guardian, to be their trustee, to manage their property until they get to 18 or 23, if you don't trust that they'll make good decisions at 18. I mean, I certainly didn't. So you have to tell them? Uh, what? If you put them on the house title set, I want my kid to know. Do I have to tell them? Uh, for yeah, because they would sign off. They would sign off on the documents. Well, if they're a minor, and then they become. So you won't. So you'll be adding a trustee on their behalf on title. Oh right. Okay. So the trustee would sign off on. What do they have to know? The trustee. No, the kid. I don't know. If the trustee don't tell them, then they don't know. <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> so, you won't off run me over exactly <laughs> in the parking lot. I was just saying. <laughs> Uh, driveway accident. <laughs> <laughs> if we get back to assignment sales, which is, you know, actually not owning the home, but having an interest in this thing that's going up uh, 20 stories high or this regular two-story home, uh, we just have an interest because nothing exists at this point. Uh, the usual things that you're looking for, if it is that, and this is the, on the presumption that you intend to just acquire the property and pass it off um, by way of an investment. You know, it's so uh, Kevin would have touched on it earlier. This is where you walk in, and I do recall someone said they've gone to a presentation, a few presentations. So you walk into this new build concept, you get the idea this property makes sense because it's in the middle of Toronto, and um, right now it's been sold for $600,000. It finishes in three years, 
no doubt it's going to be at eight hundred thousand dollars at that point. So I want to secure it now. So you sign that agreement and you make the usual aggressive down payments. Yes, they're quite aggressive. So that's your that's your agreement for purchase and sale. You've put in so far eighty-eight thousand dollars in this property. We now get to two thousand and twenty-three. And the builder says to you, oh, in December, this property will be completed and you need to start working on your mortgage. The question that you're looking for, uh, the questions that you would have had in your head at the time you signed the agreement was whether or not I could, I could assign this property. For example, I do not intend to take on that $500,000 mortgage right now. Uh, so I want to sell the property to someone. The property is worth, the property has appreciated $200,000. I'll take a slight um, haircut, so I'll sell it to someone $150,000 for $150,000, and then they get the benefit of that additional $50,000 in equity when they do close on the deal. So that's the idea behind the assignment sale, where you take on a property, you do not intend to take on the mortgage, where you get to the end that you want to pass it off, and you just want to realize a part of the equity that would have accumulated from the date you signed the agreement for sale, and now that you have that 60-story um, building in the sky. All right, so you would have been looking at to make sure in at the time you sign that agreement, you, you may not care about the other 20 pages, but you do care about whether or not you can make an assignment. Because if you don't have that there, then you get to December, you have to qualify for that mortgage, or you're going to lose that 88,000 or that 100,000 that you've already pumped in the property to cover this, to cover the aggressive deposit payments. Uh, you want to make sure that, um, that you have a right to assign and whether or not there's a fee for assignment. Usually the fees are not so much because if the property has appreciated $200,000, I'm okay paying a $5,000 assignment fee. I work that out in the selling cost that I'm passing it on to the next person. They may not know, but I'm not taking the loss for them. So that's all worked out. And of course, you'd have, this of course is my usual caveat because I'm not an investment advisor, so I leave that part mm -hmm. to discuss with them. But uh, the usual things that you're also looking for, price per square foot, um, is to make sure that it makes investment sense based on the units you're buying. Uh, so, you know, do you want to be on the 50th floor when it's just an investment property, you're paying way more money for the view and everything, or do you want to be on one of the lower floor because same price, it's cheaper being down there and, you know, I want to make back as much return as possible because I don't care about the view because I'm not the one living there. Uh, something for you to discuss uh, with your... I just wanted to... That would be something you'd have to check in the paperwork. Oh. Is do you have the right to assign? Yes, in the agreement for purchase and sale. Yeah. Or you can ask. You can you can ask. And if it's not there, um, usually at uh, when the builder is trying to get these units off their hands, they they're willing to negotiate at that point. There's nothing in the sky. There's no great demand just yet. So you can always ask them. Okay, I I, I want um, to add an assignment addendum. That's where if it's not there before, you ask your broker. Do I have the right to assign? Because the brokers are more familiar with this document, and I'm not reading that 20 pages when I'm in that presentation center. So you ask them the questions that you want to ask, and they will say, you can assign the locker, you can assign the parking spot, but you can't assign the unit, whatever it is. And you tell them that, okay, before I sign on, I want a, an assignment clause, and I want to be able to sign, assign everything, or a few things. I'm willing to pay a fee. They say, I'll charge you 10,000. I nah, I think I'll pay two. They say, okay, maybe I'll charge you five. It's a negotiation but they are willing to compromise when you just get an in because they want to get you to sign that document. Once they have you signed the document and the 10 days have passed, you're stuck and you can't come out, and yes, you have 10 days to change your mind when you realize that I just made the worst decision of my life because I can't afford this property, you do have 10 days to back out. Even when the builder tells you no, firm mm -hmm. sale, the that The law says business. you have 10 days to back out. Okay, Make sure you take it on the ninth day though because on the 10th day is a little bit of a question. <laughs> but you do have 10 days. On the 10th day, you can say, ah, you know what? I don't think I can anymore. And you walk away, you get by, you check at no, at no penalty to you. Is that a common thing, Kevin, where you can assign the parking lot but you can't assign the building? So I wouldn't say it's common, but it is allowed that sometimes the building will say, well, we can't assign the unit itself, like you said. Because the parking lots in downtown Brampton, like just one stall on the parking, sells for sixty grand, right? So it's it's considerable value. So if you can sell that, even if you can't sell your unit, you know, or sell yeah, it goes. And that's just to keep in mind now that technically speaking, when you are raising these properties, everything comes with in the usual course comes with a different title. 
So you get a separate title for your for your for your parking lot. You get a title for your locker, and you do get a title for your unit. So they actually so they may be indicated on one title, but technically they're. You know, everything is for sale now. Not even the parking lot comes for free with the building anymore. It's for sale. So you're actually buying a parking lot and you're buying something with an actual, actual title that you can sell later on. So 10 days is only for parking? No, 10 days is for purchasing of a home, generally speaking, a new construction. But they hit you sometimes. Firm sale. Don't call me unless it's a firm sale. Once you sign, firm sale. Well, they, they can say these things. Well, you do. <laughs> yeah, so that, that way you know that you. I mean, because honestly speaking, you've you've given him the check, and I mean, he's brushed off some guys. So now nah, this one is gone, and then here you are on the tenth day at five fifty, saying, you know what? Send an email. I just think I changed my mind. Can I have my check? Or or they can't cash a check before the ten days in any event. So tell them it's okay. I'm not going ahead and I'm putting a stop order on that check, and that's it. It's cancelled. Not something that you should practice still because then <laughs> <laughs> realtors will flag you and say, ah, no, I'm not doing this one. <laughs> they'll flag you. Um, can they flag you? Are you joking? No, no. Like, they're not very, they can flag you as in the sense that, no. They uh, talk to you, you yeah, know? they talk to each other. They no. say, so they flag you. So, you know, really? they may be nervous about that one. Live, live to go tell Natomi, hey, that one. As, as, assuming that she knows about me, yeah. She'll say, ah, no. I don't think you'll do that one because she does this all the time. Remember, they don't get paid until the transaction is closing. So you'd have used up a good five days because you'd have been really picky and you want the world in this place that you're buying. And nah, 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 nah. And uh, they've lost five days and they're not getting anything unless you actually close the deal. So you may be allowed to assign, but they may have a holding period that's, that's, that's um, in the document. So you don't get to assign until two years later, um, which is really not so bad because I, you wouldn't be selling right now. You'd want to hold off until, you know, there's the, yeah, the actual appreciation and there's no need to, for me to do anything right now, so that's okay. And of course, there might be restrictions at, you know, conditions on the assignment, all the things that you must do before you can pass on the assignment. You want to make sure that these are things that you actually can do if you intend to do the assignment. And then you get, of course, to the occupant, the occupational or interim closing, where you make a decision, you know, and this is where before the billing is passed to you in actual actual firm title, which is the firm closing date in December, they may call you three months or four months earlier and to say, hey, we're having interim closing, allow you to move into the unit. Um, you know, these are just the legal fees that you need to pay. You want to transfer the utilities in, in your name so we don't have to be paying the utilities anymore and all of that. That's called interim closing. And the decision you make at that point is, do I want to move into the home at that point? Do I want to rent it or do I just want to take it and you know leave it vacant? That also is a investment decision because I'll pay more if I'm buying a brand new home, but I'll pay less if it's not a resale home if you've lived in it. You know, so you want to make sure that um, that decision that you're making as a list to move in or not, take into account you know how it's going to affect your value, or you know if it works off to be the same thing because I'll be renting it for two thousand dollars and you know I may lose this amount of money over the period of time. It works out. Um, to be a net benefit, then you may want to rent. Same consideration, equity or value as it relates to a lived-in home as against a brand new home where nobody has lived in. I'm willing to pay more for that. All right. And then a final part, which I think we've already covered, is the procedure on assignment, which we've discussed. You know, you'd have negotiated most of that with the builder at the beginning. Make sure that you have the usual provisions. You'd advise them okay, I'm actually not closing this property. I've made, I'm exercising my rights to do an assignment. I'll have my lawyer come in. The lawyer would have done the usual obligations. You would have gotten the usual documents signed off between myself, between the person, who, the person who's taking over the agreement from me and the builder. It's a three-way agreement between all three parties. Just a heads up, whatever obligations you had under that document continues with you until that third party actually closes the transaction. So you've sold them, you've got your $150,000 in equity, you walk one fifty in equity plus the monies that you've already deposited in the property, so you know, because you would want that back too as well, um, and you are walking away from the transaction. You continue to be obligated to close that deal up to December 31st, assuming December 31st is the closing date. If that person fails to close the deal, you're on, on the hook mm -hmm. to make sure that the deal closes. Mm -hmm. All right, so you don't want to spend that equity that you've gotten 
too fast. You want to hold on to it just in case. Remember, if somebody's good, you know, and um, you know that they're good for the money, you may not be too worried. But legally speaking, you're on the hook until they have actually taken title. Okay, so the question is whether the income you make from an assignment sale is taxed. Yes. As capital gains. Yes, yes. yes. I do believe because I mean I have a few persons who they always ask me what's this capital gain so I can work it in the price. I'm not an accountant, I can't tell you. <laughs> because you have done the assignment, you have indicated that this is a rental property. Right? So therefore it's a tax. It's a tax. Rental or it's business? It's, a rent, it's investment. an investment property. Investment, yeah. Right? You have you know Send signals that this is an investment property from the beginning. Right? So if we give you this something, you waited until after taking possession of the property and then sold it, you can deem it as a principal residence. There's no capital gains. Yeah, there, there wouldn't be any capital gains. And what is capital gains? Percentage on all of it? Okay. Capital gains uh, is taxed differently. So capital gains is you bought a house for. Two hundred thousand, and you sold it for four hundred thousand. Uh, capital gains is two hundred thousand. The tax on the full two. Tax on the full two, but capital gains is taxed at a lower rate than um, regular income. <laughs> there used to be a time where there was they gave you the half a million dollar exemption on capital gains. I'm not sure if that's still. Yeah. I want to think it doesn't because yeah. I, I know people who. Yeah. Capital, yeah so capital. basically, they didn't tax you on your first 500000 capital gain. That used to be years ago. Yeah, and I know people who have gone in trouble for. They get the monies and they spend it and they forget about the fact that next year they have to declare <laughs> <laughs> the capital gain. But the money's already gone. So. <laughs> I'm at the end of my presentation. Um, is there anything that I missed? Good, well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.